Well, 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 the long-awaited Stephen Moffat era video is finally here. Guys, you can contain your excitement. I know there's been riots on the street. At the time of recording this, my Russell T. Davis era video has just passed 20,000 views in four days, which is crazy considering I started this channel, like, not very long ago. And we've just passed 1,000 subscribers, so I don't know where I'm at at the time of uploading this. Hopefully it's much more, but if not, why don't you just jump on board? You guys know the drill in this video. We are going to be breaking down every single episode from the Stephen Moffat era. Oh my god, that's seven years worth of Doctor Who. This is going to be a long one. Jesus. As you know, it is a tier list, so uh, we are going to be popping these episodes into well, 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 a tier list. Duh. If you're excited, make sure you do leave a little like on the video, and of course, subscribe if you haven't, you, you little devils. And remember, these are just my opinions, okay? If I say an episode's bad and you really like it, there's no need to hate me for it, okay? I don't hate you if you like an episode I don't like. It's just my opinion. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, get yourself a snack, get yourself a bottle of Prime, or whatever it is you utes drink these days. And without further ado, let's get into the review. Series 5, and we start off with the TARDIS crashing down into the Earth. Whoa, epic stuff. New theme, new vortex, new showrunner, new doctor. Beautiful music from Murray Gold as well. I'm still cooking, let him cook. <laughs> we get that iconic fish fingers and custard scene, and this. Must be out of a scary crack in your wall. Oh, that is creepy. Stephen Moffat does an incredible job of building this creepy, ominous atmosphere. Who is this Amelia Pond? Who is she living with? Why is she on her own? Where is her house in the middle of nowhere? What is going on? The Doctor decides he's going to run away and says he'll be back in five minutes. But Lamau, he was not five minutes, was he? We do see the first instance of Stephen Moffat writing with one hand in his era, over-sexualising a companion. Now, don't get me wrong, I've made a few jokes about finding women in this show absolutely beautiful, because there are some really beautiful women in this show. However, this, this is a bit much. This is a kid's show, Steve. Steve! Stop it. It just seems like you found an excuse to get Karen Gillan to dress up in a police officer uniform for whatever sick fantasies you've got, mate. Some new aspects to this era are fantastic. I love the sequence where it takes these stop motion pictures from Rory to the man with the dog. I think that's really creative and I love that. Although it is a bit Sherlocky, you can see where he got that from. I'm a bit let down by um, Prisoner Zero's design. Just a big blue worm, not a fan. And I'm also not a fan of these lens flares that they've added. What, 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 what is this? Is, is, is? We've already had Michael Bay, and we see the end of the 10th Doctor Sonic Screwdriver. Bang, bang, bye bye, see you later, rest in pieces. We get the first of many uh, naughty website jokes from Stephen Moffat. He loves the old internet history joke. He uses it about 500 times. And we see the first one in his very first episode. You know what I mean? Get a girlfriend, Jeff. Oh, and delete your internet history. Great, Stephen, knock it off, mate. The Doctor sends a worldwide virus somehow, and the day is saved until the Doctor brings them back just to flex on them. Hello, mate, it's me. I'm the Doctor, and I'm here to say I'm the girl here to save the day. But the new Doctor is here, and so is the TARDIS, which I, I, oh, I'm so sorry, guys. You're about to get really annoyed at me. Please, I really don't like this TARDIS. Okay, I just don't. It just doesn't do it for me. Or right? I know that so many of you think it's stunning and lovely, and it's your TARDIS. That's fine. It matches the Eleventh Doctor's personality really well. I'll give it that. But for me, I, I, it just didn't connect with me. And that's mainly because it, this comes off the back of the Russell T Davis era. Um, but even still to this day, I just can't find myself to like it. And I'm sorry. Okay, I am sorry. And it's the same with the Sonic Screwdriver. It's borderline. Phallic. Okay, I've seen toys that look very similar to this. Okay, I'm just saying. I'm a more of a fan of these smaller, more sleek Sonic screwdrivers. I had this as a toy growing up, don't get me wrong. Of course I did, um, but it's just not my favourite Sonic screwdriver. But we've got a brand new TARDIS, a new Sonic screwdriver, a new era. And despite me having a few issues with it, I think this is a fantastic series opener. In fact, I think it's the strongest series opener this show has ever had. This episode is going in great. The Beast Below, set on the Brexit spaceship. The episode starts with a little boy getting game ended for playing too much Fortnite and not revising. Oh, and for being terrible at acting. Yes, yeah, so walk to London. 
That's 20 decks. Little girl crying all alone on the bench. And the doctor steals her ID because he accidentally bumped into her. Doctor, mate, I'm not being funny, mate. You're building a case, all right, hanging around with all these kids. This series is really going for the doctor is a man of a fairy tale vibe. This era really goes on it and it does start to get really old about two series in. Amy and the doctor separate for some reason and then Amy gets drugged. Doctor, mate. Do you ever learn? Honestly, what, this is our first trip out and you're like, I, I've, I've got a banging idea. Let's just split up. Help us, Doctor. You're our only hope. What in the Star Wars dialogue is this? There's very on-the-nose political commentary about democracy as Amy chooses to forget about poor whale being abused. <laughs> Typical Brits. They find out that they've been abusing a whale and the Doctor has a tantrum about it. He then decides he wants to turn it into a vegetable. Ah, oh. But it's okay because all along the whale was just a giant sweetie pie. Ah, oh, roll credits. Guys, this episode is going to go in okay. It just doesn't do it for me. I don't enjoy this episode at all. Um, the story's off. It's boring. It's just a bit too on the nose for me. To be honest with you, when has the second episode of any series been good? Let's be real. Uh, so yeah, this episode's going in okay. Victory of the Daleks, set in World War II. I love this setting. Wow, we've got the cabinet war rooms. We've got the Daleks being used as a secret weapon. <laughs> what a premise for the episode. I cannot wait to see what they do with it. Well, the Doctor is absolutely livid when he finds out the Dalek boys are back. Although his meltdown, it did seem a bit over the top considering, you know, what's been happening with them over the last few years. Especially as well as it leads to innocent people being killed. Um, yeah, nice one, Doc. From the off, this episode seems off. Mark Gattis, what are you doing, lad? The Doctor and Amy separate. Again. The Doctor infiltrates the Dalek ship where more boring Dalek schemes are explained. <laughs> and then the mighty mystic Power Ranger Daleks are revealed to us. Oh my god. Wow, they really thought this would be epic, didn't they? Well, it fell completely on its face. Got the jammy dodger thing. Oh, that's a big fat yikes. Spitfires in space? I hate everything about this episode. How can a premise this good be this bad in execution? Then there's this spiel of fancying someone you shouldn't. Like, what, what, what the hell is going on? No, no, no. This episode is going in not good. The only thing I like about it was the original setting which which didn't even get utilized don't get me wrong it's not the worst episode in the world but i i don't like anything about it so yeah not good time of the angels the weeping angels are back for their long-awaited sequel going for a totally different tonal change to blink river song is back and this is where her character really changes for me in forest of the dead she's like this courageous leader sacrifices herself whilst being somewhat flirty and she seemed to be very empathetic now don't get me wrong i know the story is backwards so that was the her at the end of her character arc however mm, doctor i control you i'm a dominatrix <laughs> i wouldn't mind it if she did change over the course of the series but she doesn't she just is exactly the same the whole way through amy gets left alone and then she starts to turn to stone damn I've got bars. Uh, the law change in this one is a strange one. That any image of an angel is an angel uh, seems to be a bit of a reach, but you know what? I guess there's only so much you can do with a weeping angel, so I, I could let it slide. Considering this was Matt Smith's first episode, he is immaculate. His performance is amazing. Amy starts turning into stone, but I'm not sure why she's hiding it from the Doctor and River. Could have saved us a lot of time here, Amy. I'm not gonna lie. Oh, and the angels can now communicate, right? This, this part, I don't like. This part I don't like. However, it does lead to one hell of a speech from Mr. Matt Smith himself. Okay, I will say. Uh, this episode does have a great build-up, to be fair. The end speech by the Doctor is fantastic. Matt Smith's performance is incredible. This episode is going in good. Moving swiftly on to Flesh and Stone. Okay, starting off with this shot. Yikes. I didn't realise how bad these episodes have aged. <laughs> There's a lot of really strange ADR in this uh, in this episode. Do not blink. The big space butt crack is back and its lore is explained. It's basically used to make everyone forget the events of the Russell C. Davis era and I really don't know if I hate that or not. I can see the pros and the cons. On one hand, there was a lot of Earth invasion in Russell C. Davis' era so it's nice to reset it. However, you're basically just saying, let's just forget the Russell C. Davis era. That, that, that even happened. The sequence in which Amy has to navigate through the forest on her own is great. Really suspenseful. Love a bit of suspense. That's great. My only gripe is that we see the angels move. 
move. Oh, why did they do this? Ugh. Just completely ruined them for me. Like, that's, that's, the, that's the most terrifying part of them, is you don't see them move. And what do you do? You show them moving. And the resolution looked unbelievably dated, a bit naff. It's just, I don't know. Guys, I thought this episode was better than it was. Don't get me wrong, Matt Smith's performance is fantastic, and so is Karen Gillan's. However, this episode is completely destroyed by this. What is this monstrosity of a scene? What am I watching? I feel violated. <laughs> Why is she so hot? Oh, no, 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 no. Stephen, that is unacceptable behaviour. That is, that is too far. You are crossing lines, which you should not. This is unbelievable. I was going to put this episode in good, to be fair, until I was reminded of this scene. You know, it's going in okay. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. Look, give me all the hate that you want, right? But I am really struggling to understand why this series is so highly rated, because I'm already seeing the groundwork as to why this show started to decline after this series. Unsubscribe if you want. I cannot... I no, 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 no. I'm, I'm livid. As you can tell, I'm absolutely livid right now. Vampires in Venice. When I watch episodes like this, I realise why I'm so glad that the episodes in the upcoming series are being shortened to eight. You really realise how filler episodes are just bad. The doctor pranks Rory through a wedding cake and then just casually lets him know that he's been cheated on in front of all of his friends. She tried to kiss me. You're a dick! So obviously the Doctor and Rory have a frosty little start. I like the bit when someone says it's bigger on the inside. Doctor takes them to Venice for a little romantic getaway, but uh oh! Big spooky attractive vampires! Zoinks! <laughs> Not the royalty free woman scream sound effect! <laughs> oh my god bro! Oh. This episode is just used to batter Rory. Imagine being in love with a woman and having this incredible man constantly flex and emasculate you. Damn. Yikes, yikes, yikes. This is on par with the Lazarus Project. Jesus. The only thing I like in this episode is Helen McCrory's performance. Oh, and uh, <laughs> Rory's Spongebob insult. This, this, this way you big stupid great... SpongeBob. The story is bland, the special effects are awful, the use of royalty free sound effects, poor resolution. This episode is going in not good. Christ, I am not impressed with this series so far. I know some of you are going to be absolutely livid with me for this, but I am not impressed. I hope we see an improvement. Amy's Choice, now we're talking. The start to this episode immediately throws you off. Five years into the future, Amy is pregnant, Rory has a ponytail, what's going on? Murray Gold's music in this episode episode is absolutely beautiful. The creepy old people are the scariest part of this series so far. You're incredibly old, aren't you? And we are introduced to the Dream Lord, played by Toby Jones. Oh my god, I love it. His performance is outstanding. Last of the Time Lords, the oncoming storm. Him in the bow tie. The Doctor's irritation increasing throughout this episode builds great tension. It's really cold. Do you got any warm clothing? What does it matter if we're cold? We have to know what she's up to. Sorry, sorry. Um... You got killer old people. They are so damn creepy. I love it. Rory smashes the shit out of an old woman. Not like that, you dirty rascal. The tension in this episode is amazing as Amy has to make her choice. Which world is real? Whilst I don't believe in the chemistry between Amy and Rory, Rory's death scene is truly beautiful. Then what is the point of you? Although I will say Amy driving her and the Doctor at three miles an hour to their deaths. No, 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 no. That's completely unbelievable. That looks stupid. However, it does lead to this very, very lovely ending. Ah, oh, I love Amy everything about this episode. The incredible concept, Toby Jones's incredible performance, Matt Smith is amazing in this. I even believed in Amy's and Rory's relationship. What? Murray Gold's music. Yes, yes, yes. God, I forgot how much I loved this episode. You know what, guys? I'm slapping it in perfect. As a standalone episode, I have no issues with this. Simply just for how unique and different it was. And it wasn't even written by Stephen Moffat. Wow. Well, now we're back on the up again. I've got high hopes for the next episode. Episode. The Hungry Earth. Ah, I wonder who wrote this episode. Oh. Oh, I know. Hi again. It's me. Ah, oh, dear. This is the first time I'm going to do this, and I want to point out it's not because I hate Chris Chibnall. I have always skipped over these two episodes because I really just find them 
boring. Even before the Chris Chibnall era, this two part, I, I literally, I would always skip these two. There's nothing to even take the mickey out of in this episode. It's just boring. Genuinely, the first time ever, I'm going to skip over these two episodes, and that's mainly because I'm having to put myself through an entire era of this. So, guys, forgive me, alright? If you like this episode, fair enough, but having to re-watch this, then re-watch it whilst I'm editing, um, makes me want to myself. I just, I have nothing to say. I, I don't care for the story. There's no tension. There's terrible acting. Poor dialogue. Both of these episodes, I'm sorry, are going in god-awful, right? If you have an issue, pop a letter in my pigeonhole. Great. Where's that then, sir? Any bin. Just pop all your thoughts in a rubbish bin and they'll get to me. Vincent and the Doctor. Oh my god, yes. Oh, opening with Bill Nye, which instantly puts this episode way up. I love Bill Nye with all of my heart. The Doctor and Bill Nye complimenting each other's bow ties. God damn, I love it. Unintentional bars there as well. Nice bow tie. <laughs> bow ties are cool. Yours is very Oh, thank you. The set designs in this episode are absolutely beautiful. There is some brilliant comedy in this episode, along with some great tension and moments that will make you cry. And in my opinion, those are the three ingredients for a perfect episode. It's an episode that focuses on men's mental health and mental health in men, which I definitely think is not focused on enough in today's society. Whilst the CGI in this episode is not great, in episodes like this, it is forgiven because the story is just so good and the ending to this episode oh it is truly truly beautiful this is what doctor who is all about to me van gogh is the finest painter of the world he transformed the pain of his tormented life into ecstatic beauty but also one of the greatest men who ever lived oh wow what an episode. How did they get a guy that looks just bang on like Van Gogh as well to do such a brilliant job? Well done, son. You are fantastic. The ultimate ginger line for some reason makes me burst into tears. If we had got married, our kids would have had very, very red hair. The ultimate ginger. There is only one thing I can say that I don't really like about this episode, and that's the CGI monster. Other than that, this episode is just beautiful in every way. I love it. This episode, ladies and gentlemen, is going in perfect. Wonderful. The Lodger. Wow, the Doctor gets yeeted from the TARDIS because he spotted a Ryman's. Uh-oh, it's the man from Carpool Karaoke. Ho-ho-ho. <laughs> it's hard to forget that this man was once loved by everyone. This episode is a fantastic comedic break from a serious space cracks timey wimey shenanigans. I love the dynamic between the Doctor and Craig. The Doctor's alienness is really focused on in this episode as we never see him really living a normal life. I know Amy is considered to be one of the best companions of all time. I can't lie. I find her so cringy at times it actually grates on me. Doctor! <laughs> We see the Doctor turn into Prime Ronaldinho, and I love this bit. We're gonna annihilate them. Annihilate? No, no violence. Not while I'm around, not today, not ever. I'm the Doctor of the oncoming storm. And this sequence as well is just perfect. Of course it's not true. I'm not staying in a cool centre all my life. I can do anything I want. Uh, oh yeah, right. This just encapsulates how the Doctor is a perfect role model and just the impact of his words could empower someone. Wow, and with humour as well. I simply love it. The ending to this episode is a bit strange, so it's just a way for Craig just to confess his feelings for Sophie, which, don't get me wrong, very sweet, very nice. I do like it. All in all, though, I really enjoy this episode and it's always been mine and most people's comfort episode and that's why I'm putting this episode in great. Oh, guys, Series 5 has just turned itself around. I'm enjoying it. The Pandorica opens. Oh, we're getting to the first season finale of the Moffat era. And what an opening this episode has. It includes characters that we've seen so far from across the series. Beautiful. Vincent's painted a picture of the TARDIS burning. Ooh, consider me intrigued. The episode is set in Stonehenge. And fun fact, I was actually editing part of my Russell T. Davis era video whilst driving through Stonehenge. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's a fun fact. And it is a fantastic setting, considering that it's believed that Stonehenge was built by aliens. Wow, genius stuff. Right, I'm going to keep this brief because there's a lot to get into. I will say it's great to see Stephen Moff do some proper action stuff. I love it. I love the pacing of this episode, the direction, the beautiful music, the gripping story, and a nice bunch of nostalgia bait to make all the Russell T. Davis era fans cry. A happy tear. The sequence where the Doctor doesn't miss the obvious. Yes, I know that, Rory. I'm not exactly one to miss the obvious, but we need everything we can get. Oh. 
missing something obvious, Rory. Oh, chills. This is Stephen Moffat at his best. A tintillating first part with an iconic speech from the Doctor. Again, this is where Stephen Moffat shines. I love everything about this episode. The acting, the story, the cliffhanger, the beautiful, beautiful music. 10 out of 10? What's that? This episode is going in perfect as well. Moving us on to the series finale, The Big Bang. Oh, this episode starts how series 5 started. <sighs> Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to do that again. But wait, the doctor never arrived. Oh, I'm not going to lie. This is where the two part gets all timey wimey, which don't get me wrong, is great for adults. Absolutely confusing for children. Whilst the teleporting doctor stuff is great and makes for great comedy, I fundamentally hate the 2,000 years waiting thing. I feel like Stephen Moffat did this a lot, where he'd just throw random things into the plot and just make someone wait or be around for thousands and thousands of years, to the point that even if you think about it logically, it's so unbelievable, and you think, 2,000? That's a long time! Despite the change of pace, it becoming much more of a slow burner, I can appreciate the story was wrapped up very, very nicely. It's a nice wrap-up to to the cracks in space and time with a beautiful end speech from the doctor to Amy when she was a child as he gets a raise from time. Brand new and ancient and the bluest blue. Then we have Amy Pond remembering. Raggedy man, I remember you and you are late for my wedding! Yeah, it's a bit cringe, but we do kind of need the doctor back, I guess. I do really enjoy this episode, um, despite it not being anywhere near as great as the first part. Um, but it is great still, so I'm going to put it in great. Well done, Stephen Moffat. It's a cracking season ending to this series. Guys, I'm looking at this tier list, and you know what? Earlier on in the season, I was absolutely slate in this series. And now, it's pulled itself back. It definitely is a great series of Doctor Who, but there's just some stinkers in there. But Vincent and the Doctor, Amy's Choice, the Pandora opens the lodger yes 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 it's a very good series guys all right those of you that clicked away earlier you're regretting that now because i actually do like this series quite a lot it's christmas 2010 and we get our first taste of moffitmas yep i did that and what will he bring a retelling of an iconic christmas classic we get michael gambon yes 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 cgi shark looks great sometimes. The setting for this episode is stunning. I love it. Whilst Russell T. Davis goes for the action-packed Christmas fun, Stephen turns Christmas into a more magical experience for all. Ah. Uh, this episode also gets plus points for having a child actor who isn't terrible. <laughs> the line Catherine Trussman, it's this. Or go to a room and design a new kind of screwdriver. Don't make my mistakes now. Made me burst out laughing. Stephen does have a strange habit of making people that were children five seconds ago now love interests. That's the strangest sentence I've ever said. <laughs> Apart from the occasional Stephen Moffat horniness, which is starting to become part and parcel in his era, this is a bittersweet story. And a story where Stephen actually lets a character die. Michael Gambon is wonderful in this episode, and this scene really breaks my heart. A beautiful ending, a beautiful story. And until I rewatch this, I now think this is the best Doctor Who Christmas special to date. This episode, guess what, guys? Going and perfect. Well done, son. Well done. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is where... Doctor Who starts to tail off. Series 6. The Impossible Astronaut. Starting off with some Stephen Moffat horniness. Of, of course. And we get even more River Song. Uh, I just remembered this whole series is basically her arc, isn't it? I do love the intro to this episode, though I cannot lie. We are introduced to the silence, a monster design I absolutely love. The Doctor gets game-ended. What? Shock horror, shock horror. Oh my god, this is such a shock. He's definitely not going to come back because it's definitely not episode one of the series. How can River perfectly aim at the Doctor's hat but misses every shot on that astronaut? Cracking jaw blast. I really do not find this scene emotional as it was trying to be because, yeah, it's... It's the first episode of the series, so uh, yeah, not, not a thumbs up from me. The tension that builds around the group as the past Doctor tries to figure out what is going on. Fantastic stuff. And that sequence in the Oval Office is absolutely brilliant. I'm going to need a SWAT team ready to mobilise. Street level maps covering all of Florida. A pot of coffee, 12 jammy dodgers and a fez. Shout if you get in trouble. Don't worry, I'm quite the screamer. <sighs> For fuck's sake, Steve, honestly, will you just give it a rest? As annoying as Steven's libido is, this is yet another cracker of a first part. Gripping story, great setting, fantastic music. 
Oh yes. I've been keeping these very brief. I do apologize. It's just this video is going to be really long. This episode is going in great. I sure hope the second part lives up to expectations. <laughs> the day of the moon. In typical Moffat fashion, the second part becomes way too complicated for any young audience to even comprehend. Amy and Rory getting game ended. The doctor in Area 51. Don't even get me started on the River Song diving into the TARDIS swimming pool scene. Ugh. That console is placed directly in the center view of the doors, right? Her falling into the TARDIS would mean that she would have gone directly into that console, instantly being inviscerated, all right? Which, by the way, would be absolutely traumatic for everyone involved. But psych, it's all a prank. They're not even dead. Haha, <laughs> you've been pranked, viewer. You've been pranked. The sequence where Delaware Man straightens the Doctor's bow tie, I like. Making the audience feel like we also forgot an encounter with the silence. I do like that a lot. The sequence at the orphanage is unbelievably creepy. I try to clean it up. And we get the first glimpse of the pirate lady. Ooh, how ominous. Amy has been taken or died. Okay, we do not need to keep doing the presidential music every time. We, we get it. We get it. He's the president. He's President Nixon. We get it. Stop it. Make me. Yeah, well, maybe I will. <sighs> Ew, ew, ew. I hate the flirt. I just hate it. I hate it. I, this is the part of River Song and the Doctor I absolutely hate. Stop it. It's horrible. Ugh. Anyway, broadcast gets blurred to millions. Silence equals dead. Sad times. And baby River regenerate. Oh, so, so, sorry. Spoilers. <laughs> All right, this second part was disappointing compared to the first part. I can't lie. The resolution just seemed a bit easy. Stick random MacGuffin in spaceship and all is over. Ugh. It does have some great creepy sequences and I love the overall setting and vibe to this story. But it just falls victim to Stephen Moffat's tendency to overuse timey wimey shenanigans to fool the viewer. I'm going to put this episode in good, but um, I feel like Stephen's stories, though, are starting to become a little bit repetitive in the way that they're structured. You can tell when he's written a story and when a standalone writer has done an episode. It's really obvious, and I just, I don't know. The Curse of the Black Spot. Ooh, we got Pirates of the Caribbean setting. Very interesting. I wonder if it's going to be good. Based off this intro. Yo ho ho! Yeah, this is not going to be good, is it? Amy disarms a pirate that has a gun with a sword. Yep. Yeah. Seems, seems plausible. Uh-oh, Rory's got the black spot of death. I love how the doctor can hold Rory back, but if it comes to any of the crewmates, they're just like, yep, in a, in a bit, lad, in a bit, lad. See you, rest in peace. Liar! He's no wicked pirate! Yep, terrible child actor, episode straight in the bin. Bye-bye. The only thing I think I really like about this episode is the doctor and the captain in the TARDIS. I love this sequence. Wheel, telescope, astrolabe, compass. A ship's a ship. You had to gloat, didn't you? I'm not gloating. I saw that look just now. Ha ha, his ship is rubbish. Ooh, yikes, yikes, yikes. Dead. No shit, Sherlock. Why did it take so long for them to figure out that she was a nurse whilst they were down in that ship? Anyone with a single brain cell figured that out a second they walked in. And also, there's been so many of these fake companion deaths now. Honestly, it's getting annoying. I feel nothing towards this scene at all. Oh, blubby blubby Amy. Oh, Rory's dead again. Who cares? Who cares? In all fairness, I remember this episode being a lot worse than it was. However, I'm just going to put this episode in okay. It's not terrible, but in no way is it good. It's just another filler episode. The Doctor's Wife. The Doctor gets space mail, then has to leave the universe and says this is the furthest we've ever gone. Yeah, we hear that a few times throughout this show, don't we? Then a lady absorbs the soul of the TARDIS. Ah. The only people on this planet is auntie and uncle. Two people from Plymouth, apparently. And do my will. You are most welcome. This is so jarring. It's hilarious, but creepy at the same time. The way it's explained that the house feeds off of Archer and energy and munches on TARDISes. The fact that auntie and uncle are made of dead Time Lords. The Time Lord voices he could hear were distress signals. In fact, the whole setting is just destroyed TARDISes. Oh my God, this is juicy. In here, they put me in here. Borrowing implies the eventual intention to return the thing that was taken. Are all people like this? Like what? So much bigger on the inside. I can't help but think if Saran Jones played the 13th Doctor, the Chris Chibnall era would have been completely more bearable. She is amazing in this and she has everything that Jodie doesn't, i.e. charisma. She's got wonderful screen presence and so such a buzzing personality. I wish she played the Doctor. Honestly, she would have been incredible. Everything turns very, very dark when Amy and Rory are finding their way through the TARDIS and Rory becoming old. And over and over and over. Rory. 
And that haunting part where Amy finds Rory after he was waiting again is frightening. It's the 10th Doctor's TARDIS! Yes, I love it! Fear me, I've killed hundreds of Time Lords. Fear me, I've killed all of them. What a fucking line. Oh. All in all, sure, the Doctor builds a TARDIS a bit too easily, but in this context, it is completely plausible, I guess. And the resolution is a bit meh, but this episode is fantastic. Dr. Foster, Karen Gillan's performance, Matt Smith's tears, Michael Sheen's sexy, smooth voice, and the Russell T. Davis era TARDIS. Oh my god, this episode is great. Oh, look at it. Slot right in there. Beautiful. Even the ending where the Doctor is having just pure joy with his TARDIS melts my heart. And I tell you what, Matt's TARDIS is growing on me. It really, really is. The Rebel Flesh. I hate getting to this point of a series where the early two-parter in a Stephen Moffat season tends to be a bit pants. Despite the goofy suit designs, this episode has an interesting premise. I'm very intrigued. I'm getting irritated with all the full body pregnancy test thing. God, the Doctor's been looking at this for like four episodes now man. Just get her a clear blue test if you're so worried, Doctor. The side characters in this episode are just tripe. All I could get is that this guy likes money, this guy is Scottish and likes a bit of music, the, the boss is a stupid authoritarian, Jennifer is from Yorkshire and has a weird crush on Rory. Oh, and, and this guy, he just likes to sneeze sometimes, I guess. Why is Rory following Jennifer into a bathroom and being strangely protective? And what the fuck is this shot? And then it gets even worse. What, what, what is this? Look, I know I said I wasn't going to criticise the CGI on dated episodes, but that's only within reason and when CGI is necessary. What is this? Seriously. Also, I don't get how these monsters that look genuinely creepy at times can be so hilarious. <laughs> Seriously, what is going on with this Rory and Jennifer situation? Why has Rory taken such a liking to her? It's weird. This fella runs at Boss Lady while she's holding jump cables that will electrocute him. He literally killed himself. But it's okay because Rory does exactly the same thing and then manages to, 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 to disarm her. <laughs> Bloody hell, spit it out, man. And the cliffhanger is so funny with Matt Smith looking like that. Oh my god. God. I really don't know how to feel about this episode, honestly. It had such an interesting cloning premise, all to be filled with bland and empty characters, Rory's weird obsession with Jennifer, and the hilarious moments with the gangers. Yeah, this episode is... it's not terrible, so I'm gonna put it in okay. The hopes for the second part are not high, let's just say that. <laughs> the Almost People. The episode starts with the Doctor quoting random past regenerations and just screaming. Oh, you like a jelly baby? Hello. I'm the doctor. No, let it go! We've moved on! Just... Eh? I can't lie, I was watching this in about 20 minutes or so. I was just falling asleep. It's just a lot of standing around and talking. The doctor has a meltdown whilst Rory's just aimlessly wandering around. Jennifer's death scene is absolutely hilarious. And Rory's just like, um, yeah, I, I want to smash, so uh, I'll just follow you. Yeah, why not? Anyway, more boring story continues for another 20 minutes. This sequence with the telephone, I hate, purely because of child acting and all the gangers just sort of give up in the end just like yeah what's the point oh and all the day is saved yuck oh and amy turns into a cum puddle so there you go boring characters terrible acting destroyed premise extremely poor cgi no tension because i simply don't care this episode is going in not for me that's all i can really say a good man goes to war. I forgot that this was technically like a season finale because this is when they decided to split the series in half. You can tell Stephen Moffat's back because when he does these action-packed style episodes, he just crams everything into it. Rory acting all authoritarian is just hilarious to me. I can't take him seriously. Oh, don't give me those blank looks. And there's a lot to take in from this intro, and I remember watching this as a kid, and I was just so lost. As I said, all of Stephen's bombastic episodes are structured like this, that to a young audience, it's so easy to fall behind and get confused. And I remember as a kid, this was the point where I was starting to drop off from the show, because every time I stopped watching, I was like, eh? I will say the Doctor's introduction into this episode is great. Then there's just even more thrown into the mix with all these monsters from the BBC costume cupboard coming out, and it's playing out exactly the same way as the Pandorica over opens with all these characters from across the series just popping up. And I will say, all these characters that are coming to the Doctor's aid, weren't these the ones that put him in Pandora's box because they wanted to stop him? Good men don't need rules. Today is not the day to find out why I have so many. Damn, that is that that line is pretty cold, I can't lie. But it turns out this whole thing is a trap. They want 
Bebe to be a soldier. Now listen, the whole baby has Time Lord DNA because it was conceived in the Time Vortex. Uh, it makes no sense. Loads of aliens have probably done this, right? And I know it was conceived in the TARDIS, blah de blah But the TARDIS is a machine. It's not made of Time Lord. Uh, the whole biology behind this is confusing. It's then revealed that River Song is Melody Pond. Look, I know a lot of you love this twist, right? And I feel like Stephen actually had no clue what to do with River, and then he had this revelation which made him piss his underwear and turn it into this. It's the whole dodgy logic behind Amy and Rory conceiving a Time Lord that is blocking me from appreciating this twist. Don't get me wrong, it's really clever, but it just, just didn't leave me dumbfounded and I can't get past it. I can't help but feel that this episode was slightly rushed, the pacing was strange at times, the headless monks left a lot to be desired, and essentially this episode is just a setup for whatever is to come next, and I sure hope it pays off well. <laughs> Listen, I'm gonna put this episode in good, just for the twist and Strax and, and the decent intro. But if I was having a bad day, I would definitely put this episode in okay. See you in autumn, guys. Let's kill Austrian man. One thing I've noticed with Stephen Moffat's era, his episodes can never just pick up where they left off. It always happens to be at another point in time that it just confuses everyone. Well, how did everyone get here? Well, we're just in the future now, are we? Okay, cool. We get introduced to Mel and are just told to believe that her and Amy were bestie westies, despite she's never been mentioned. Never. But it's okay because we get a monster to show that we're wrong and actually they are best friends. <sighs> so this, this Stuff like this is so important if you're gonna try and pull a twist like this. And please, can we stop with this penny in the air? Yeah. BS. The pretentious Sherlock stuff. No, no, no. Don't get me wrong, I actually do really enjoy this sequence where the Doctor is talking to Robot Amy simply because Matt Smith is just great. And hearing the Doctor saying, Help me. Like that is it's just so heartbreaking. Oh, Matt, I just want to give you a cuddle. Anyway, River uses all of her remaining regenerations to save the Doctor in another death that is not really a death. God, this is getting boring. I'm not entirely sure how his regeneration was disabled, but she can give him some of hers. Ugh. And notice how I didn't even mention the big Austrian man in this episode. Why? Because it was actually completely irrelevant. The miniature people could have gone after any other space criminal. There was literally no need for the for, for Berlin. I just feel like this was used to get people to to watch um didn't do a very good job. Anyway, this episode actually wasn't as bad as I remembered. Alex Kingston was very, very good, but the Mel stuff I just find to be a load of BS. I'm gonna put this episode in okay, really. It's just okay. Night Terrors! Great! An entire episode with terrible child actor. Ugh. We're in for a rough ride, guys. I would quite like to understand the logic behind a child whispering to themselves and it appearing on the Doctor's psychic paper, because uh, if this was the case, then the Doctor would have come to my house many a years ago. Now, if you're watching BBC One on Saturday night, you will have seen Rolf Harris and Kate Humble. <laughs> Rolf Harris. Oh, big yikes. Old lady getting eaten by bins is hilarious. All I want is my 350 pound. Your rent is 350 pounds? Fucking hell, mate. I'm moving. I'm moving. Get him out. I'm, I'm moving straight in. 350 pounds. Sorry. <clears throat> 350 pounds a month. That's mad. Him explaining that George's fears transmitted through time and space and the dad is just being like, oh, soinks. Okay, then. Yeah, uh, that's a bit strange. Okay, cool. Like, what? If I had a man in my kitchen doing exactly this, I would call the police. The doctor makes dad confess his son is adopted right in front of him. That's, that's cute, isn't it? JK, he's actually an alien? The transformation sequence is absolutely horrific. I love it. Then Amy gets nabbed, but because of budget, they couldn't show it. Then the power of love saves the day. Right, this episode seems a bit confused. Is it, is it a comedy? Is it a horror? I don't know. Uh, the only thing I really enjoyed about it was the creepiness of the dolls and that epic transformation. Other than that, this episode is just okay. The Girl Who Waited. Look, I know it's not Stephen Moffat that wrote this episode, but there seems to be a habit of these two waiting for each other. Jesus. Amy presses the wrong button, and she's now in a separate time stream. Ooh, how intriguing. This seamless shot of Rory changing from the red to the green room is absolutely amazing. Well done, Mr. Director. Very good job. The concept to this episode is amazing. Oh, the sterile looking set and that garden is absolutely beautiful. We are introduced to the old Amy, and the makeup looks amazing. Although her building her own sonic probe. Uh, yeah, I'm not too sure about this, Chief. <laughs> I think that's the first time I've laughed in 36 years. 
Oh, starting to tug at the heartstrings now. The speech that Amy gives about meeting someone and getting to know them and finding them to be the most beautiful person you've ever met was stunning. Absolutely gorgeous. And it would hit home with many people as that is what true love is. As I have very much experienced that myself recently, meeting someone and getting to know them and finding them just to be the most beautiful person. That really got me. Well done. Amy does a half ass Macarena and they unite. Yeah, I'm not too sure on all of the slow motion fighting at the end there, but the ending is absolutely absolutely brutal oh only now has it actually clicked that i believe in amy's and rory's relationship and guess what it had nothing to do with stephen moffat all stephen moffat can seem to do is write about how horny each other are tom mccray actually wrote a beautiful love story one writer's strength is another writer's weakness wow 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 well done this episode is going in great i love this episode the God Complex. The gang gets stuck in a hotel that has rooms filled with people's greatest fears. Ooh, I give this era something, right? It has such unique concepts. I do simply love it. It's in the execution that it can tend to fail. And that's another example with this episode. I don't know why all the pictures listing people's fears and it has that one guy that says Plymouth makes me absolutely die. And I love this chat between the Doctor and Rita. Him taking a fascination to her being a Muslim is very, very sweet. Well done. Very nice. Very nice. You're a Muslim. Don't be frightened. <laughs> it's a shame that her death's impact is lost with these terrible slow motion shots and dramatic music. All right, Doctor, she she wasn't that great. Right, let's just let's just calm it down. Child Amelia is brought out of education yet again to make a five second cameo. Look, I'm going to keep this brief because this episode had such an interesting premise and I think it just fell a bit flat. David Williams' comic relief was hit and miss. Rory gets completely sidelined and is irrelevant. And it's yet another episode that's resolved by faith in the doctor but in this instance he isn't so great so don't lose the faith but deep down he is the greatest man he is literally god he's best uh, i don't know i feel like there's been too many endings like this it's all about characters feelings and it's starting to just get a bit boring also this bit really confuses me where david Walliam says see that planet there the green one there that's where i'm from that yeah haha -ha, very funny but then his next joke is this could i have a lift just to the nearest galaxy will do. What do you mean to the nearest galaxy? You've just pointed out your planet. It's, it's right there. What are you talking about? Bland side characters. Interesting premise that wasn't executed in the best way. Look, whilst this episode is not completely terrible, look, it's good to have on in the background, I guess. Look, it's just going to go in okay. All right? It's okay. Closing time. One last call for alcohol. Uh-oh, Catsman is back. Uh-oh. Again, this is when Gavin's mate was actually liked. I remember being so excited when this was released. I loved The Lodger and was excited to see The Doctor and Craig together again. And I know that some people dislike The Doctor, talking baby, but I find it to be some... some Excuse me. I find it to make some great comedy. I love the idea of the Doctor working in a toy shop. It's absolutely fantastic. No other Doctor would be able to pull this off. Albeit his uh, obsession with children is a little bit strange, I won't lie. The Doctor confessing his love for Craig is great. To be fair, I think every series of Doctor Who needs its comedic break. The Doctor sees Amy, but it turns out she's now gone big time. Now, when it comes to the resolution, it plays out exactly the same as the Lodger. Craig loves, loves something. His son. Yeah. I actually would have preferred this episode if Craig actually died. I mean, we never see him again, so why not? Setting up great for the series finale, yeah? Look, it's another comfort episode I enjoyed as a kid, mainly because it wasn't a Stephen Moffat mindfuck, but I definitely didn't enjoy it the second time around. This episode is great comedically, but story-wise, it leaves a lot to be desired, and the ending where he talks to the kids is just really weird. This ep- Stop it! Shush! This episode is going in okay. Now it is time, ladies and gentlemen, the wedding of River Song. This entire series has been building up to this, the day that River kills the Doctor. Definitely written by Stephen Moffat, because this intro has you like, what on earth is happening? Whilst the concept of this is really cool and it's a really interesting opening, me as a child completely checked out of this one. Mark Gattis makes another appearance. God, this man returns to the show more than bloody David Tennant at this point. Luckily... Oh, seriously. <laughs> Phone on silent. I'm working. Despite me being hella confused, luckily, blue-headed man explains absolutely everything to the Doctor, and then he gets a call about the Brigadier. I think it's sweet that they use this to let the Doctor finally see that it was time for him to die. Except he doesn't die. He's just standing on a terrible green screen, and uh, River drains her weapon systems. 
Eh. As I said before, this episode for me was when I checked out as a kid. I gave up. Whilst moments from this episode are really cool, it was so difficult for me to follow and I actually stopped watching the show at this point, obviously until the 50th anniversary. Even though now I'm a big strong boy and I understand the story, I still seem to feel completely underwhelmed. Rory gets game ended again. JK Lamal, no he doesn't, he's alive. You and me, we should get a drink sometime. Okay. Married. Fine. Uh, this makes me giggle. I like this line. I like this line a lot. Then River and the Doctor just get married. That's a marriage, apparently. I don't know how. They don't explain it. It's just that they're married now. But it turns out the Doctor just used the Tesselector or whatever it's called to cheat death. Ugh. You can tell it got to that mid-series break and Stephen was like, oh shit, I actually have to get out of this one. So he decided to create the bow selectors to introduce and let's kill the Austrian man. It just feels really rushed and underdeveloped and just kind of forced. And you can really tell this wasn't pre-planned because of that terrible green screen reshoot. If you deep it, Stephen's episodes are getting really repetitive. A whole season finale where they go into a different reality that never really existed or oh, sound familiar and where Amy and Rory forget each other uh, sound familiar and how the doctor is the most important man that ever 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 lived no one is more important than the doctor your guys this episode is going in okay Jesus look at the amount of okays the amount of episodes I've really enjoyed in the Stephen Moffat era so far and the majority of them weren't even written by Stephen Moffat why is this always the case this era so far there's just so much teasing and not in the fun Russell T Davis way it's just the doctor will die the whole silence will fall just kept going and going and going and going the confusing timey-wimey intros that are cool in concept but really repetitive the amount of horny comments i've not even included in this video is absolutely astonishing by the way steven's second series has come to its end and honestly it's already starting to feel slightly stale <sighs> It's Christmas 2011. The Doctor, the Widow, and the Wardrobe. Guess what, guys? I'm going to save you some time with this one because I really can't be asked. It's absolute dog shit. Going in god awful. The less I say, the better. How can Stephen Moffat write an episode like a Christmas Carol and then follow it up the next year with this big steamy turd? Not even wasting my time on this one. Ah, series seven. A. This series is so strangely structured because it took three breaks. With Asylum of the Daleks airing on the 1st of September 2012, with five episodes remaining left of Amy's and Rory's fun times. Then it comes on at Christmas, 25th of December 2012, has another break until March, then at the end of May has another break until November. <laughs> Why did they not just do series 7 and then make 2013 series 8? Effectively, there's two series going on in one here. I just, I, I find it very strange. Either way though, we start off with Asylum of the Daleks. The start of Matt Smith's final series. <laughs> After all of the Doctor Who I've consumed recently, I'm loving Matt Smith so much and it's going to be really sad to see him go again. Oh, Amy and Rory are now getting a divorce. Cool. Let's just undo the last two series worth of relationship building just for a throwaway bit of pointless conflict in this episode. Yeah. The title sequence now has this horrible 2012 Instagram filter over it where they turn the saturation up to 200. Why? Oh, it's a bloody Fazbear. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I cannot believe. I managed to cram a Five Nights at Freddy's reference in there. Get in. <laughs> Hello, Clara Oswin, Oswald, the impossible girl, the girl who waited, the boy who waited, the girl who's there, the girl, the impossible girl. Hello. I love the concept of this episode. The Daleks are too scared to destroy the asylum, so the Doctor and co are forced to do it for them. Ooh. Some of the set pieces for this episode are great as well. <laughs> Genuinely creepy stuff with the people dancing as well. Love it. So Amy and Rory are forced to have this strange argument to rekindle their love. I do love that part though where Amy sees the Doctor straightening his bow tie just to show that it was his plan all along to get them back together. Ugh, I love the Doctor. Very cool, very cool. And the twist of this episode is great. I really like the twist of this episode. It really throws you off, although you can sort of piece it together quite easily. I actually enjoyed this twist more than the whole River Song thing. Interesting. I remember when I eventually came back to the show, I remember enjoying this episode quite a lot and I still like it. Uh, creepy at times. The twist is good. The thing I dislike about it the most is the whole Amy and Rory randomly wanting a divorce just to resolve it for some pointless conflict. I don't know. Uh, this episode's going in good, to be honest. I like it. Dinosaurs on a spaceship. Christopher Cheppers is back again with another absolute 
belter. When will this man guess right a good episode? We are introduced to Rory's dad, where he accidentally just gets brought along and just casually accepts it. Ah, uh, yeah, we're gonna see a lot of this in Chibnall's writing in the future. God, I am dreading his era so much. Uh... I learned all about you at school. You're awesome, big fan. High five. Amy asking for a high five is just the most Chibnall thing she could do. It's like Chris Chibnall doesn't really know how to do comedy and just thinks doing something <laughs> awkward is absolutely like top tier comedy. <laughs> oh great, more Silurians. You like your Silurians, don't you? Anyway, Peep Show turn up for even more comic relief, you know, because this episode hasn't had enough terrible comedy in it so far. That wasn't very Christmassy. By the way, I'm a huge fan of Peep Show. Don't, I'm not criticising Peep Show. Then Peep Show have terrible aim whilst Doctor and Co are completely still. Yep, again, we will definitely not see any of this in the Chibnall era. What is that, man? Oh, well, come on. You're shooting two pensioners on a flight of stairs. How many are there? They were swarmed around that whole spot. And you're telling me that every single shot missed. Doctor, this is a two-man job. What are you doing? I'm easily worth two men. Now, I'm getting the hint based on the 26 comments he's made, he might be a sexist man. Just just a hunch. And just to top it off as well, it seems like he ends up with the woman he was making sexist comments towards. So a uh, really good message to send out, Mr. Chibs. I do not like a single thing about this episode. We've got a weak villain, weak characters, terrible, terrible comedy, out of character moments, flat out bland. So if you like this episode, don't know why. I don't know what's good about it, but it's, it's god awful. God awful. Bye bye. You're only saying that because it's written by Chris Chibnall and you don't like the Chibnall era. No, no, no. I've always hated this episode. Don't even come at me with that one. A Town Called Mercy. Two of my favourite films of all time are Django Unchained and The Hateful Eight, which are set in the Wild West. So it's so exciting to have a Doctor Who episode set in the Wild Wild West. Whee! But what we do get is a terribly designed cyborg looking for Peter Sutcliffe. I would have loved to have enjoyed this episode, but it is so boring. And in the end, Pete just blows himself up. There's literally nothing for me to talk about in this episode, apart from the amazing western music from Murray Gold, love it, and the great setting. This episode is flat out boring. Characters, again, with no substance, a bland story, a goofy looking cyborg with a silly voice, the Doctor is completely out of character at some points, and it's just completely forgettable. Such a shame. <laughs> episode is going in not for me. Soz. Well, we didn't get much of a break, but Chibland is back with the power of three. So what? I quite like the idea of following Amy and Rory around in their normal life. It's something that's been lacking in the Moffat era. It's all been too fantastical and fairy tale. We needed some good old RTD normal human life stuff. And we even get some of them RTD television shots. Wow. Cubes fall from the sky and are everywhere. And we are introduced to Kate Lethbridge Stewart. Oh my god, unit, unit. Okay, Christopher, consider me intrigued. One thing I will give Chibrington is that he seems to write middle-aged men characters quite well. I love Rory's dad and his curiosity and commitment to helping out. I love it. One thing I don't understand about this episode, though, is why the Doctor doesn't just travel a few months into the future instead of just, you know, waiting around. Tension is raised when the cubes become active and they start counting down. People start going for sleepy bye-byes, sleepy bye-byes. This is the villain. This. This. The most cliché, boring unthreatening looking monster. Just as I was starting to forget that it was a Crib Chisnell story, this brings me right back to reality. Oh. It's villains like this that make Doctor Who a laughing stock. Then, the Doctor simply just uses his sonic screwdriver to just hack the cubes and bring everyone back. It's quite literally the worst resolution in history. But it's over. Literally, just like that. Bye, Kate Leverage Stewart. Love you. To think that for the first 10 minutes or so, I was really enjoying this episode. This had such a deplorable ending. It's actually laughable. I was going to put it in okay. Do you know what? No, no, no. I'm, I'm changing my mind back. It's going in not good. Not for me. Angels take Manhattan. You can really tell that Doctor Who started airing on BBC America, can't you? Oh, we've been here an awful lot lately. But the angels are going to take over the Manhattans. Uh, the Statue of Liberty being a weeping angel is an absolute joke. I bet Stephen Moffat thought this would look really cool. This is really epic. No, it's really stupid. You're telling me that not a single person was looking at the Statue of Liberty and it just strolled right along. Are you okay? The 
Weeping Angels throughout this episode are constantly looking at each other. I thought the whole thing was that they couldn't look at each other. That's why they're weeping. Am, am, I, am I not understanding something here? This random introduction to the Doctor hating endings just so it can be used later in the episode to tug at our heartstrings. River Song is back as well and it's in this episode where I'd finally just had enough of her. Please, River, you've done your bit. You got married. Can we just end this now? I'm getting really bored of it. Rory gets touched in the basement and sent back in time and dies. Again. So Amy and Rory decide to create a paradox with this terrible slow motion jump to their death. They think that their day is saved, but haha, <laughs> Rory gets touched up in a graveyard. He's dead again. He's dead again. And this time, it's for good. Golden Bennett, how many times did it take for this man to die to finally die? And Amy sacrifices herself with him. Bye bye. <laughs> This episode is a mess. I just can't help but feel like the angels have just lost their oomph in the Moffat era. Where's the angels from Blink? Simple, scary, petrifying. Such a shame. Such a wasted story this was. And I can't help but think it's a bit of a flat ending for Amy and Rory. But I suppose they had to get rid of them to make way for Oswin, Oswald, the impossible boy. I don't really know. It's on the brink between good and okay. I'm going to put it in good, mainly because I like Amy. I like Doctor. I like Rory. They were good together. And it's the end of an era. So I think we should see it off with the rose tinted glasses. So that's series seven A done. And look at it. It's a mess. It's an absolute mess. This whole 2012 era was awful. We're going to sit back and relax and wait for Christmas 2012. The Snow Boys. Christmas 2012 starts with some terrible child acting. Please, please, Stephen, stop using the kids. The boy who waited his back. God damn, I forgot how much I used to be in love with Clara. Uh, not, not this bit, though. Doctor. We've got a new theme tune, new title sequence, and new TARDIS spoilers. Just to really show that the 11th Doctor is really going through his emo phase. Do you know what? I can't help but think that if Stephen didn't want to do this whole timey wimey impossible girl tripe, this Clara would have made for a really interesting companion. A Victorian companion. That would have been amazing. Of course, Strax is back. Love Strax. He's my fave. I think I've been run over by a cab. I also like that in this episode, the Doctor subconsciously puts on his bow tie when he starts to help again, because he's kind of, you know, he's like, I'm coming back, I'm coming back. But this, this TARDIS, oh, I love it. I love it. Look, oh, look at it. This is more like it. Wait, what? Clara's now falling to her death. Oh, Laval, she's rest in pieces. Anyway, the day is saved, and uh, the Doctor's like, oh, zoinks, I have to find out who this Clara is, because uh, she likes souffles or something. This episode isn't that bad. I quite like it. The music's great. The TARDIS is great. Matt Smith looks great. I'll put it in good. The Bells of St. John. Why does the 11th Doctor spend so much time sitting around in unusual places with big hoods? What are you trying to be ominous for, you mysterious boy? Wi-Fi is big and scary. It's so scary, in fact, that I remember back in 2012, I was using Tesco Wi-Fi. Yep, that was a thing. Clara gets spooned, and then there's lots of mashy, mashy keyboard stuff. I invented the quarter cycle. I love this. I don't know why, I just love this. This version of the 11th Doctor is my favourite. I just adore him in the ending to his time as the Doctor. He just seems older and wiser, and his babbling is less annoying and childlike and more fun and whimsical. Whilst the stories may not be as good, I just thoroughly enjoy Matt Smith in this series. I feel like he's just having fun playing the Doctor, and I love it. I give respect to this episode as well for its ambitious sequences, like the plane sequence and the sequence in which he rides up the shard. Brilliant stuff, in my opinion. Bebo, MySpace, Habbo. Habbo? What do you mean Habbo? As in Habbo Hotel? Yes, Clara found you because you were running a credit shop on Habbo Hotel. Nice. Anyway, Clara gets spooned again and the docs ain't having none of it. And he's all like, put her back. Put her back right now. Bow ties are cool in that. And that's exactly what happens. She gets put back and the day is saved. Hip, hip, hooray. Guys, for some reason, I'm putting this episode in good as well. Whilst it's really not that strong story-wise, there's just something about it I've always enjoyed and I still really enjoy it. So I'm putting it in good. God damn it. In a good mood. The rings of Anakin Skywalker. It's Clara's mummy and daddy. Wow. Because this exact leaf had to grow in that exact way. So that precise wind could tear it from that precise branch. And if just one of those tiny little things had never happened, I'd never have met you. 
Ugh, Clara's dad is a wetty. Bin him, bin him. The Doctor takes Clara on her first adventure and we finally get to see some cool original alien designs. That's about time, taking me straight back to the end of the world. But in typical fashion, Doctor just ditches Clara. Yep, he tends to do this on his companion's first trip, doesn't he? Little girl sings song to Simon Cowgod, but it's a no from him and he starts sucking her off. God, we need to stop using that term. <laughs> this god guy has a strop, so the Doctor delivers this like beautiful speech or summit. Wow. Yep, another adventure that turns into hey it's all about me the doctor yeah it's all about me and that is literally all this episode is memorable for this speech that the 11th doctor gives wow there's nothing to this episode at all yet it's held so highly for some reason because of beautiful song i find it so boring oh my god yeah guys i'm putting it in okay i'm putting it in okay Cold War. Yet another episode from Mark Gattis. <laughs> Actor who plays Prince Charles in hit TV show The Crown gets strangled. Actor who plays Prince Philip in The Crown lands his TARDIS on a submarine where he meets actor who plays Prince Philip in The Crown. They chain up and interrogate an ice warrior. By the way, I just want to point out the ice warriors do not look good in modern Doctor Who. Why did they bring them back? There's just a whole lot of nothing but walking around a submarine. And is it here? Is it not? I don't care. Yeah, these these look really poor. Really, Jesus. Okay, yeah, these look bad. And basically, the Doctor then just simply asks him to leave, and he's like, yeah, all right. That was this episode in a nutshell. Nothing else. God, this episode is awful. Straight and God awful. I cannot be bothered to even talk about it. Bye. And you are? Ghostbusters. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hide. Doctor and Clara go to some house and just spout a shitload of exposition. Then the gang go ghost hunting. Don't get me wrong, there's some really interesting conflict between the Doctor and Clara after she witnesses the life cycle of Earth. That's very good. I like this. Very good. Thumbs up. These two characters I've already forgotten about have some sexual tension. Anyway, they've got to save this uh, time traveller from some pocket universe or some shit. The TARDIS interface says how it can't go into the pocket universe because it will be dead within four seconds or whatever. The Doctor is in the pocket universe. The entropy would drain the energy from my my heart. In four seconds, I'll be stranded. In ten, I'll be dead. Yeah, and then it proceeds to do exactly that. Then there's this random love story just shoehorned in. What? What? <laughs> oh man, Series 7 is abysmal, isn't it? Uh, I don't like this episode. Um, I initially liked the idea of the ghost. That was kind of interesting. Uh, sorry guys, this episode is going in not for me. Journey to the center of the TARDIS. Now this could be interesting, right? So a spaceship sucks off the TARDIS for some scrap uh, where we meet our lovely greedy side characters for the episode. I can't tell you what their names are because I just do not care. Although when they do beat open the TARDIS, you can't help but feel its pain. we Stop bullying him. Such an interesting interesting premise for the episode. Finally, we get to see beyond the TARDIS console. Oh my god, we're gonna see all these epic rooms. Where does the Doctor sleep? What does he do? What does he get up to? What do the companions do when we're not on screen? I'm so excited. We see a library, a brief view of a swimming pool, and um, some glowy balls. That's about it, I guess. Man steals the TARDIS egg, so the TARDIS throws a tantrum. Either way, they eventually find Clara, and the Doctor's all like, ha ha, call in the camera crew, everyone, because you've been pranked. You've been epic pranked. Then there's this twist where one of the lads isn't actually an android, he's a human or something, and I don't really care because the acting in this episode is so appalling. Oh, this episode was so promising. We didn't even get to see as much as a TARDIS as I would have hoped for, but I suppose the bond between Doctor and Clara grows a bit. Yay, I guess. And the episode's resolution solution is just another yoinks thanks to crack in time this actually never happened lol lol calling concept again terrible in execution guys i'm putting this episode in okay god what a shame i am not in a good mood apparently god this series is piss the crimson horror Oh my god, people are getting turned into lobster people. Oh my god. We get Strax and Lizard and Woman back. Hooray. I only like Strax, really, to be honest. Jenny just picks a lock in front of absolutely everyone. No one seems to care. Holy smokes, it's Doc. And he looks like a dog's penis. But now he's okay. Then he kisses Jenny. For some reason, why did he do this? And I really like the sequence in which Strax threatens the horse, but then it just gets absolutely ruined by this god-awful sat-nav joke. Turn around when possible, then, at the end of the road, turn right. What is your name? Thomas, sir. Thomas Thomas. Really? Who wrote this? And then it's immediately followed up with an erection joke. How cheap. Anyway, there's some ongoing conflict. This old woman's pretty good, I guess. And then uh, Strax shoots her and then she somehow does a front flip over this staircase and then falls to her death. 
Okay. Then there's the ending where the kids just find pictures of Clara time traveling in school. Where did you find these pictures? And also, when did the Doctor and Clara have time to take all these snapshots when uh, they're running away from ice warriors and things? What's, wh wh when did this even happen? There's some really interesting horror concepts in this episode with some genuinely creepy shots. But this is just another bland episode. But don't get me wrong, guys. It ain't completely terrible. So, uh, again, I'm just going to pop this episode in okay. Nightmare in Silver. Oh boy, I'm so excited. We get another episode filled with more terrible child acting. Yes, 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 yes. Guys, I am screaming for a good episode here. It's been so long since I've had an episode I've enjoyed. I've got a sandwich. All right, <clears throat> take a seat. Where the fuck did that sandwich come from, lad? Where did it come from? Anyway, kids get kidnapped by this flash cyber boy or something. You will be upgraded. Oh, Christ, this is just awful. This is awful, this is. And the rest of the episode is the Doctor arguing with himself whilst he plays chess. Honestly, that is it. Activate the desolator. Warwick, mate, you could have done this right from the start, you absolute plum. Literally, the only thing that holds this episode up is Matt Smith's incredible performance. This episode is nothing but poor child acting, flat side characters, and a boring old story. God, Series 7, what is going on? I am putting this episode in not for me, and I'm not even going to comment on this. A mystery wrapped in an enigma squeezed into a skirt that's just a little bit too tight. Stephen, my patience is wearing unbearably thin, all right? I know for a fact it was you that wrote that line. We're scraping the barrel here, lads. Okay, I'm wanting a good episode now. I sure hope it gets better with the name of the Doctor. The episode starts with a great, albeit awfully edited, compilation of all the previous Doctors. Oh, yeah, you know me. I'm a sucker for a bit of nostalgia bait, lad. I like the idea of a subconscious FaceTime between Strax and Gang. Oh, it's River Song. Back again. Jenny gets absolutely game ended by a bunch of slender men. Then River communicates with Clara because she kept the line open. Sure, the sight of the TARDIS being dead is frightening though. Look at that. The idea that the bigger on the inside seeps out as the TARDIS dies. Oh, love it. Anyway, River Song opens the tomb because of spoilers. Then the Doctor's timeline starts to get rewritten. And then the Impossible Boy is finally explained. Hooray! Then we get that epic twist that John Hurt was the Doctor because Christopher Eccleston was busy that day. Do you know what, guys? It's actually nice to have a Stephen Moffat episode that wasn't a complete confusing timey-wimey mess. One where there's actual intrigue, characters I like, some actual payoff that makes sense, and some great nostalgia bait, which perfectly sets up the 50th anniversary special. Guys, I enjoyed this episode. It's going in good. Happy days. After a lacklustre Series 7 and plummeting ratings, it was time to bring out the big guns. The long-awaited 50th anniversary of Doctor Who. Viewing in 394 countries simultaneously and viewing in cinemas, it was time for... Oh my god, it's David Tennant! He's back, he's back, he's back! The Day of the Doctor. Starting with the original Doctor Who opening sequence. Mwah! And Clara is now a teacher. A apparently. Oh, but it starts off epic with the TARDIS being airlifted to unit with that epic music that was last heard in Aliens of London. Seeing David Tennant's name popping up on that screen, God, 13 year old me was weeping. Then we get some epic time war goodness, love it. Billy Piper is back and I remember when it aired, I was so upset that she wasn't playing Rose Tyler again, but me being my big age now, I completely understand. David Tennant, David Tennant, David Tennant. Why is his hair so flat? It's like since he left whenever he comes back they just can't quite get his hair right like series four doctor hair mm, i've got to control myself he looks older here than he does on the 60th anniversary mm? the way all the doctors come together is amazing and the chemistry between david and matt is tintillating oh, oh lovely i love the timey wimey joke timey wimey thing timey what i I've no idea where he picks that stuff up. Upon second viewing, the little hints that Kate gives to show she's a Zygon is absolutely great. Then the transformation into a Zygon is even greater. Ruh, ruh, ruh. The conflict between the Doctor and the Doctor and the Doctor. 
so gripping. I just want to watch an episode where the Doctor talks to a previous incarnation for like four hours. I'd be so happy. The way the timey-wimey phone call links in is so great as well. Yes, this episode is so damn good. Questionable slow motion shot, okay. All they had to do was increase the frame rate and this would have looked a lot better. Something tells me I didn't realise this until the edit because it don't look great. Ugh. Sure, there's a bit of a naff countdown sequence, but then the moment, no pun intended, comes. Where these terrible green screen shots happen. Now, I used to think these were terrible, but then I remembered that this was shot for 3D. So in 3D, this would have looked like an actual projection. would look nuts. Just a shame that it didn't look that great in 2D, though. The resolution to this episode, albeit unbelievable, is just epic. Every Doctor saving Gallifrey, such a beautiful nod to the 50 years of Doctor Who. Then to close it off, John Hurt's regeneration, seeing that little glimpse of Eccleston. David's I don't want to go, still intact. Then, just when you think it's episode bye-bye, fucking Tom Baker rocks up with his beautiful voice. You know, I really think you might. Oh, chills. Such chills. It's so great. Such a beautiful moment for even all the classic Who fans to absolutely wet themselves over. I love it so much. What an episode. I love it all. Any weaknesses in this story is made up for with the comedy, the chemistry, the beautiful ending to the Time War story, David Tennant, Matt Smith, John Hurt, even he plants himself as the Doctor. Good job. Just love everything about this episode. Of course, guys, it is going in perfect. The time of the Doctor. Matt Smith's final episode as the Doctor himself. I'm actually very upset, guys. I've loved him so much more watching him this time around for this video. This episode is, of course, written by Stephen Moffat because it starts with this terrible Doctor being naked scene. The Doctor goes to church and wowee, what a surprise. There's flirting with yet another female character. Please, I've been rocking it for centuries. Nice, though. Tight. Does Stephen know that not every female character needs to be so horny? Being flirtatious and very openly sexual does not equal strong female character, Stephen. That's not how it works. Oh, look at that. The cracks are back. FML, SMH, KMT, not Lamau. I'm so glad that we get to see the back of these cracks after today. The Doctor protects this town of Christmas and starts to age. I appreciate that he's loved by the children, considering this incarnation of the Doctor is very fond and great with children in a non-creepy way. Why do I feel kind of sad for a Cyberman head we were only introduced to 30 minutes ago? I can't help but feel that Matt Smith had a whole lot of nothing to do in this episode because he spends the vast majority of it being old. However, the final act of this episode, I can't lie, is beautiful. The Doctor struggling to pull the Christmas cracker is so heart-wrenching. Not to worry because he's been granted with 12 more regenerations. I'm definitely sure this won't be retconned. The Doctor starts to regenerate because of old age and stuff, but he has this beautiful speech on how everyone changes and in a way we all regenerate. He has a little heartfelt moment with Amy and then the 11th Doctor regenerates. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not a fan of this regeneration. It's almost like the Doctor's been edging for so long he just ejaculated into a new person. I'm not saying he needed the same regeneration as everyone else, but this looks really cheap. However, this introduces Peter Capaldi, the 12th Doctor. God, we've come so far. Guys, this episode is going in good. Don't get me wrong, it's a poor final episode for a Doctor, but I can appreciate a great send-off. I'm aware that Matt Smith is a lot of people's favourite Doctor, and for a while I didn't get it, but upon re-watching his era, it is so clear why. His version of the Doctor is the youngest, yet oldest and wisest, the kindest, yet most alien, the most caring and erratic Doctor we've had, and Matt Smith was perfection. It's such a shame that Stephen Moffat in his era forgot that Doctor Who is about the adventures, not about how everything comes back to the Doctor and how everything is about him. This era has all been teasing and not a lot of pleasing, but Matt Smith, I salute you. Well done, son. It's safe to say Series 7 is such a deterioration from Series 5. It's so sad. The Day of the Doctor does bring it back. Nice. But this series was a mess. Some people like to defend it, but let's be real, it's poor. It's very, very poor. Guys, this concludes... The Matt Smith era. Series 8, ladies and gentlemen. It's just 
laid an egg. Your grasp of biology it troubles me. I love this line. It's my favourite line in this like entire era. <laughs> this introduction is not particularly great, especially with these strange slow motion shots that are really confusing. Like, why why is it doing this? Why what is why is it doing that? The twelfth Doctor starts off very arrogant and quite rude. It reminds me of the introduction of the sixth Doctor, which didn't go down too well. It's just not the best first impression to the viewer, guys. A lot of muscular young men doing sport. Is that sport? It could be sport. Ah, more horny jokes. Yes, as you can tell, Stephen's still at the helm. Yeah, he knows what he's doing. It's so much horny, so much horny. I love this sequence where the doctor scares the shit out of this man. Had at least nine previous victims. I thought you were painting me. I was working. What is the point of this joke? I don't understand. Just another excuse to get a woman to dress slightly provocatively. Doc and Clara go for a roller coaster of fun times. Then Clara passes the doctor his sonic screwdriver in the stupidest way possible. Eh? This episode, there is a lot of talking, 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 talking. It takes us 53 minutes to see the doctor finally in action. Then after a lackluster battle sequence, it goes back to talking but it's okay because robot man unalives himself oh rest in pieces just as we get used to peter's doctor they cram matt smith back in again whilst it's a sweet conversation it completely takes away from peter's first episode imo imo i'm honestly very confused by clara's issue in this episode as if she hasn't just entered his entire time stream and met all the incarnations of the doctor now there's a new one she's like what new doctor this makes no sense ah and then we end the first episode with some more of that classic moffat teasing who is this mystery mystery missy this episode is a mixed bag and i'm not sure upon rewatching it if i like it or not because i'll be honest with you a large chunk of it i was trying not to fall asleep there's a few really nice moments and i think peter eventually gets there but in my opinion this episode is just going in okay Ugh, not a great start into the dalek fresh meat crashes her ship with some fairly decent cgi shots okay Wowee, the Daleks are back. I can't wait. The Twelfth Doctor starts the episode with some absolute sass. In charge of your vessel. You'd starve to death trying to find the light switch. Who are you? The arse queen and all that. We are introduced to Daniel Pink. Ugh, how boring this character is. God, he's so boring. I'm his carer. Yeah, my carer. She cares so I don't have to. You know what, guys? It's safe to say I already love the Twelfth Doctor. <laughs> they go really biggy smalls and enter the Dalek via a colonoscopy. Any remarks about my hips will not be appreciated. Ah, oh, your hips are fine. You're built like a man. Thanks. This Doctor suits Stephen's comedy so much more than Matt Smith's Doctor did. I love it. Anyway, the Doctor opens his mind to the Dalek and he's all like, No thanks, Daleks. I ain't part of this crew. I don't give a crud about the Daleks. They're actually kind of bad still. You are a good Dalek. Yeah, this line doesn't have much of an impact because we've already had this before. But I'll tell you what, the side eye this Dalek gives, god damn. Tell you what, guys, this episode is actually good. I quite like it. The sass this episode brings is great. I love the concept. And as a standalone episode, it's, it's all right. I'm putting this episode in good. Robot of Sherwood. The Doctor and Robin Hood have a sword fight for some reason. Then there's this ongoing boring dick swinging contest before they get captured. When there's some more swinging of the schlongs. The Doctor and Robin break out of their chains off screen whilst Clara's getting borderline essayed by Boff. Uh, Robin's a robot or something? I don't really care. Or he's not. He's real. Boff and Robin have a sword fight before he falls into fire pit, Miss Van Moff style. Wow, wow, cool. And the day is saved. God, this is a crap episode, isn't it? The only thing I like in this episode is Peter Capaldi. We're going to be hearing that a lot this era, by the way. I'm putting this episode in God awful. It's bad. It's really bad. Bad, bad, bad. Listen. Listen starts with the Doctor somehow meditating on top of his TARDIS. Great shot, by the way. But this is the first time we see the Doctor give a monologue. This fits in so well with the new age Doctor. I love it. And Stephen is back to scaring the heebie-jeebies out of little children with ankle grabs. Yikes. While I don't agree that we've all had this dream, we have all had this fear that there's something under the bed that's going to grab our legs. I still do it now when I turn off the lights and I have to run up the stairs because I'm scared something's going to come and chase me. That was obviously just a joke, guys. I'm a big, strong boy. I don't even get scared of nothing or no one. I don't even care. Yeah, man. They end up going back to Danny's past where there's this big spooky wooky quilt monster. <sighs> I will say though, this sequence is great, but what lets it down is more of that god-awful child acting. This child is supposed to be scared right now. 
He, uh, don't look it. It does get a little bit odd with Clara's distant relative coming in and then they go to his ship and the Doctor starts getting sucked off. But this sequence is great in which they arrive at the Doctor's past where we find out the Doctor's fear stemmed from this very moment. There's a great message about how fear is not necessarily a bad thing and it's the first time we see the Doctor as little little baby boy who's a massive pussy by the way. Pussy. Look at you getting scared. Some of the editing is really strange and choppy, but I think this episode is actually very good. But what's blocking it for me is the inclusion of Danny Pink, all right? I just don't like this character as a whole. And I'm not entirely sure why him and Clara like each other. I get that he's a troubled man, a former soldier, but I'm sorry. Speaking as a true alpha male, like I am, no woman upon first meeting is going to like a man like this. Are you making fun of me? No, 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 no way. Okay, he ain't ready for no relationship. Anyway, apart from that sidetrack, guys, I actually think this episode is good, so I'm putting it in good. Time heist. The episode starts by establishing the fact that Clara and Mr. Pink are now knocking boots. Hooray. Then Professor and iCarly wake up after having their memories wiped. Ooh, how intriguing. The gang are being forced to rob this super rich boy bank. The main thing I will give this series is that it is beautifully shot. It seems to be so much more care going into the way that these are directed. I absolutely love it. And we are introduced to the teller, which has a great design. And what does he do? Well, he sucks off his victims, of course. Anyway, they start the time heist and the shapeshifter woman starts getting sucked off and instead of helping her the doctor just explains to her how traumatic her death is going to be that's that's nice isn't it let's start feasting on what's left can i become one of those things we saw sitting in a cage yes anyway there's a lot of wandering around until the doctor eventually gets saved by the side characters hooray then there's this twist that the doctor set up the whole heist Cool. Then they try and convince the audience that this group are all friends. Ah, oh, happy families. Nobody cares. This episode again, great in concept, beautifully shot with some really nice stylized editing, great alien designs, but the lackluster characters and stupid moments let this episode down. I will say this episode is great in style, lacking in story. It's going in okay. The Caretaker. This episode starts with a montage of how difficult Clara is finding it to balance Daddy Boy and the Doctor. Zwinks, there is trouble afoot as the Doctor goes undercover as the Caretaker. That's, that's the episode name. The comedy in this episode, I absolutely love. You have got kidnapped by Boggins from space and then you all formed a band and met Buddy Holly. Go. When the doctor gets the guy Clara is dating wrong is great. It's all because he thinks he looks like Matt Smith. Love it. Doctor meets disruptive influence and actually her child acting is not that bad. Her chat with the doctor was actually pretty funny. Good to meet you. And you. Now get lost. The way this alien is described is as if its arm alone could wipe out the planet, yada yada yada. But in reality, it's a crab with a ray gun. Now, Daddy's shock and anger is completely valid after he messes up the whole resolution to this episode. But I can't lie, the attitude the Doctor has towards him is absolutely hilarious. I love it. He's your dad. Genius. That is, that is really, really brilliant reasoning. Clara confessing her love means absolutely nothing to me because I simply don't care or like this character yet. But this causes some conflict between the Doctor and Clara. Then Danny decides he's gonna dish some sass back. He's an officer. I'm not an officer. I'm the one who carries you out of the fire. He's the one who lights it. Out. No. Finally, something from this guy. Yes. It's nice to have a robot that's not CGI and it's completely practical, but it leaves a lot to be desired. But it is safe to say the alien is not the main point of this episode. This episode is simply just to reveal the Doctor and Clara's relationship to Danny. I enjoy this episode a lot. Peter Capaldi is absolutely fantastic in this. Despite some end cringe, this is a good episode to me, so I'm putting it in good. Kill the Moon. Set in 2049. Guys, that is literally 25 years away. This episode is 10 years old now. Just let that sink in. No being sick, no hanky-panky. Doctor. Uh, Doctor, if you had implemented those rules sooner, uh, you wouldn't have had a wife. Just saying. It's like you kicked a big hole in, in the side of my life. Yeah, you know what? I take back what I said about this child actor. Irritating me. No, not good. Get in the bin. Get in the bin. Uh-oh! The moon is getting plump, and it turns out it's got lots of moon spiders on it or some something. The moon's an egg. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, what? I, I didn't quite catch that the first time. What did you say? The moon's an egg. Can we try that for a third time? What was that? The moon's an egg. Um... What? 
Guys, this episode basically becomes a pro-life episode where three women have to decide whether or not to unalive a little baby. What is going on? Uh, basically, yeah, the world's uh, uh, the world's at risk and the world's going to end because the moon's now an egg for some reason. What's the science behind that? That just is what it is. Clara then somehow broadcasts to the world, leave your lights on if you want the thing to stay alive or turn them off if you want it dead. This is so stupid. There's like 50 things wrong with this. Half the world is in daylight. Not everyone speaks English. Not everyone would be watching this broadcast i could go on and on and on but all of this is for nothing because in the end clara stops the detonation anyway then the moon egg hatches and lays another egg what have i just explained to you i d <laughs> setting an episode in the future where most of us who watch this episode is going to live through seems crazy to me now i know that sci-fi pushes boundaries and it's fiction but this is way too far-fetched this is completely ridiculous the only thing i like about this episode is clara's little outburst and putting the doctor in his place. Why do you have to be mad? This incarnation of the Doctor is the most alien to human social cues, social cues, and does come across quite condescending and rude. However, in this situation, the Doctor's argument is actually justified. Oh, there's so much wrong with this episode, guys. This episode is awful. The child acting, the shambolic and unbelievable story, the comedy attempted was not good either, and the whole thing just left me scratching my head. God, this episode, guys, is going in god awful. It's not been a great start to Capaldi's era, right? Nothing's standing out just yet. We need something to bring it back. Mummy on the Orient Express! Oh, this episode starts off with such an interesting concept. The timer on the screen counting down to the victim's death. A spooky looking mummy. I love it. Clara wants to ditch the doc after last episode's events, but I do love the doctor's reaction to this conversation. Do you know what the singer said? Well, frankly, that would be an absolutely astonishing guess if I didn't know. We meet Perkins, played by... Who the Doctor clearly wants for his next companion, already looking for Clara's replacement. Nice one, Doc. The mummy goes around sucking people off as we are introduced to voiceover man who's playing with them all. Ugh. The Doctor trying to figure out why the dummy mummy is doing this whilst it's taking someone's life is such a great sequence. God, I didn't speak English right there. Even Perkins questioning the Doctor for his lack of humanity, but we know he's under pressure, so it's completely justified. This all makes for great television, yeah? Oh no, the Doctor becomes the victim by injecting someone's mental illness into him somehow then they say code word and they teleport to earth and drop everyone home off screen wow as much as i mock it this is the best episode of the series with a few minor flaws but the story the way it's structured the great side characters the great tension guys wow we brought it back this episode is going in great arguably one of the best peter capaldi episodes there was well now it's on the up we got flatline up next can't lie though the episode starts off with this goofy ass opening uh Oh, wall aliens are trying to turn everything into 2D. And that's when we meet Rigsby. Rig Rugby, Rigsby, Bugby, Bugboy. Danny suspects Rugby and Clara are smashing Gooches. Sounds um, kind of active. Um. Anyway, these aliens start melting people into walls and I absolutely love the visuals in this episode. They look amazing. But it's okay though because Dr. Hans Clara a MacGuffin he made on the spot somehow just to turn things back into 3d wow epic C plot convenience seriously though look how great these visuals are they're so different oh no doctor in tardis and the train is coming it's okay though because the doctor saves himself and does this little dance then he dies jk lamau he's alive how did clara think of this right albeit it's quite cool even the smartest human would not have known to do this right this is way too sci-fi technical I'm, I'm not buying this clara is um an intellectual genius all right i'm just not buying it enough. Anyway, Doctor goes all Brexit on them. Remember this. You are not welcome here. And cast them back to wherever they came from. Wow. Spoken like a true Tory. This episode has great visuals, a fascinating premise, and a great story. I like this episode and don't have too much bad to say about it. So guess what, guys? I'm putting this episode in great. This is the forest. Of the night. What? is with Steven's obsession with using child actors in this era. I'm convinced that there should be laws about using child actors because 90% of the time they are absolute shite. Mr. Pink was looking at you, well that explains why you're lost. 
I love the Doctor's distaste for Daniel. It does make me die. The TARDIS now has a sat-nav voice just to tell the audience that he is where he should be. I hate this. We've never heard this before. Where did this sat-nav voice come from? Uh-oh! The Earth has been taken over by big bulging bushes! So the world decides that the best way to sort this issue out is to set fire to all the trees. The world is in its most flammable state. Let's set fire to it. Wow! Maeve's gone. Maeve's lost in the forest. Maeve's gonna die! Oh. This episode is just oozing bad acting. I'm not even going to discuss this sequence with the falling statue because Christ, this was awful. Listen, guys, I know I slate Danny Pink and I don't like him, but Jesus, he is constantly being lied to. Why does he like Clara? Their relationship has not been fleshed out enough for us to care, so why should he care? She is for the streets, man. It's a common theme that women that travel with the doctor treat their boyfriends terribly. What is this about? Anyway, Tiger turns up and Danny, along with 12 kids, just calmly scare it off. What? That's a tiger. If I was a 12 year old, I'd be screaming for my life. We are here. Here always since the beginning and until the end. What the hell is happening? What is going on? Well, you know what, Doctor? This time, the human race is saving you. Clara is really starting to grate on me after these last few episodes. She's becoming quite demanding and entitled, forgetting the fact that she's been treating both the Doctor and Danny like complete poo. Anyway, the message of this episode is trees are great. Please stop cutting them down, Lamau, please. Preachy, terrible, unbelievable story. Not in a good way. Awful, awful child acting. And more annoying Danny and Clara BS. Put this episode in the bin, set fire to it, and delete all traces of it. God, 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 awful. God, I want to punch something. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is time for Peter Capaldi's first season finales. Clara, mate, it helps if you actually answer the phone, you pleb. Takes away from uh, Clara's confession of love, to be honest. Oh, oh, daddy's dead. Lamau, 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 rest in pieces. Rest Clara has a meltdown and takes it out on the doctor. She's only salty because she spent the last 10 weeks treating him like ass. Whilst it's a really interesting scene, it means absolutely nothing to me because Clara and Danny's relationship meant nothing. All we ever saw of it was them two arguing. Why should I care about these characters at all? Doctor. Go to hell. Jesus, on a second watch, this, this, this line really threw me off. God damn, Doctor. This episode has the darkest concept the show has ever gone for. You go to the afterlife, but if you're cremated, you die for good. God, that is horrific in concept. And this actually upset a lot of viewers, and understandably so. This episode came out four weeks after my late grandad passed away. Three days before his funeral in which he was being cremated. This messed me up. And the reason it did is because that man was a huge Doctor. Doctor Who fan. Danny meets child he game ended then tries to have a chill conversation with him. Hey, hey listen, listen. Hey. Why are you confused? He's running away, mate. You kid. Didn't you, didn't you shoot him? No. Nah. Look, I'm not going to waffle too much, guys. This episode is gripping from start to finish. The horrific concept. The big reveal of the Cyber Boys. The epic twist that Missy is the master. The first time lady of the series. Yes, yes, yes. Guys, I love this episode. As horrific as it is, it is, it is a good episode. I like it. It's going in great. Death in Heaven. I'm the Doctor. Yeah, this episode starts with some cringe. But hey ho, Kate Lethbridge Stewart comes in and the Cybermen get scared or something. It's then revealed that the Doctor is the president of the world. God, it just sounds so stupid. What is it with this series and its completely ridiculous concepts? Anyway, it starts raining and turns the dead people into cyber boys just because that can happen. Osgood gets game ended by Missy, but let's get one thing straight. Michelle Gomez is absolutely amazing. Further showing to anyone who disagrees with the female Time Lord that they can be done right. She is incredible. In fact, I quite like the whole of this plane sequence. It's, it's pretty decent. Like it. Thumbs up from me. But that's about as good as it gets because then there's this Boring, standing around in a graveyard, talking, 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 talking. The majority of this episode is set in this graveyard. What oh, bloody Daddy Pink? I don't care. Just go away. Then there's some Russell T. Davis explosions and the day is sorted. Oh. 
I feel like the less I say about the Brigadier being a Cyberman, the better, to be honest with you. The first part was so good. And the start to this was decent, but the fact the majority of this episode took place in a graveyard, and then there was more Danny Pink and Clara Cringe completely ruined it. What a pants season finale. This episode is going in okay. Uh, that, that's pushing it. Look at the series, guys. This is definitely the most mixed bag we've got. Three great, three good, three okay, three god awful. And there's some hidden gems here and there, but the show is so inconsistent now. It's no mystery as to why this series started to decline. Anyway, that's series eight wrapped up and finished. Ho, ho, ho! Christmas 2014! Santa crashes onto iCarly's roof. And I really like the play on the ludicrous of parents buying gifts. Nobody likes the tangerines. Anyway, these creepy scrotum monsters come in and then Santa just blows them all up. My little pony. Shut up, you. Yeah, I've got lots more, babe. I like Santa. He's very good. I like it, Sant I like Santa. There's a horror movie called Alien. That's really offensive. No wonder everyone keeps invading you. Good joke. I like that one as well. Made me giggle. Anyway, Carla gets sucked off and the doctor decides he wants in on the action too. So he gets sucked off as well. Danny's back and there's some more Clara and Danny cringe just when we thought we were out of it. No, he's back again. The doctor's like, wake up, Clara. Wakey, wakey, silly girl. Can't be in the dream for anymore. Anyway, they all realise they're dreaming and then they believe in Santa to wake themselves up. Wow, what a beautiful Christmas story. Roll credits. Psych. They're in yet another dream. And then it turns out they're, they're in another dream. So it's a dream within a dream within a dream. What an interesting concept that's never been done before. I've always believed in Santa Claus, but he looks a little different to me. Christ. This is the worst line ever said in this show's history. That is, that is shocking. Just when I thought the episode was over, no. It keeps on going. Now Clara's old or something. And it looks terrible. Look how terrible it looks. And why is she even more northern? I like you, Doctor. You're well alright, actually, in my eyes. Because I'm just an old bird, and I love lasagna. <sighs> it's a special that's trying to be too clever again. The only thing I really like about this episode is Nick Frost. He's great. I love Nick Frost. Good, good stuff. But when I thought the Danny Pink tripe was over, no, we get even more. Guys, this episode is okay. Right, I don't not enjoy it, but I don't enjoy it by any means. Uh, there's some good old Christmas fun times in there, just just to sprinkle a bit of Christmas cheer on it. That's about it. It's, it's okay. Series 9, boys and girls. I had a severe phobia of hands growing up, so this intro still creeps me out to this day. Anyway, terrible child actor reveals he is Davros, and the Doctor's like, yeah, fuck this, mate. We've got the Shadow Proclamation coming back, the Sisterhood of Khan is back, Davros is back, Missy is back, hell yeah. It's just a shame we've got this cringy Segway snake man. <laughs> There's some Clara mashy mashy keyboard stuff and they just find the doctor just like that. All of this shows history of them saying, we don't know where the doctor is, it's such a mystery. Why didn't they just do this before? Anyway, there's an attempt of comedy and it's revealed that Skyrim is back. Damn, all these things are coming back. All we're missing is the Backstreet Boys. <laughs> Never mind, Missy gets game-ended, Clara gets game-ended, TARDIS gets game-ended, Davros gets game-ended, question mark? Whoa, I like this episode. Solid build-up, lots of nostalgia bait, and a good little series opener, to be honest, right? This episode is going in good. The witch is familiar. Never mind, Clara and Missy are alive. They're alive. Then there's some nostalgia bait to explain the ridiculous plot convenience. Not impressed, Stephen. This is cheap. The Doctor hijacks Davros's whip, and then there's some terrible comedy. So, anyone for dodgems? Missy traps Clara into a Dalek. Very cruel. I still cannot get over how good Michelle Gomez is in this. She is so good. And then Davros starts being all cutie patootie, and the Doctor's like, um, what, what's going on here, lad? You cannot be for real. Oh my God, you for real. No, you for fake. No, you for real. You lying. Then them two start having a little chuckle together. God, the performances here are so good. Then he gives the doctor the puss in boots eyes.
Psych! Doctor's been pranked. Davros is a little prankster and he's pranking the doctor into using his regenerations. Anyway, the doctor starts getting sucked off and the bin Daleks start getting proper arsey about it. And then the doctor pretends like he knew what he was doing all along. Yeah, sure, doc. I don't really have an issue with the second parter. Um, it's not as good as the first by any means. Um, there's some failed comedy. Don't even get me started on the Sonic glasses. The Sonic glasses. I hate this. Tacky Primark glasses with a Sonic screwdriver sound effect plopped on top. No, no. No. It feels as if Stephen Moffat was running out of ideas at this point, right? And he's making this somewhat intriguing aged wise doctor character something absolutely ridiculous going through some sort of midlife crisis. I hate it. Despite my qualms, Davros is great in this. Peter Capaldi is great in this. Michelle Gomez is great in this. I'm putting this episode, surprisingly, in good. Under the Lake. Deaf Lady, Stephen Merchant, Love Interest, Muscly Man, all find a ship. This is the second story in a row where the character who isn't white dies first. Um, Steve? Care to explain yourself, lad? Grandad and Cliff land on an underwater space base where Abraham Lincoln and Muscly Man try to lumberjack the Doctor. What? If it all goes pear-shaped, it's not them that lose a bonus. Of course, the typical cliche, I care more about money than lives character. Ugh, he's definitely not going to be dead in a minute. I will say, though, the Doctor's reaction to him is good, though. It's okay, I understand. You're an idiot. The card reading sequence is cheap comedy that is not funny. I just don't like it. This man knows how to speak to human beings. Granted, he's an alien and this, this doctor's very quirky and very strange, but he, he, he does know. It's just, stop it. Also, I'm not entirely sure on the logic behind them being able to pick up objects but pass through walls. This is a very common thing with ghosts. But it's very clear what's going on. These ghosts just want a little cheeky smooch. Look at this. Anyway, the ship starts flooding or something, and then oopsie poopsie, the doctor is now a ghoul too. <sighs> Guys, I know a lot of people like this episode for some reason. This episode is so boring. It's so boring. I'm usually a fan of build-up episodes, but this was not it. This was just boring to me. This episode is going in okay. Moving on to Before the Flood. Doctor gives a fourth wall break monologue about Beethoven. Then he tells me to Google a bootstrap paradox. Um, Doctor, I, don't even, I really knew that meant silly. I don't even need to, I don't even need to look it up. So shut up. Then there's this electric guitar rendition of the Doctor Who theme. Sounded pretty cool, won't lie. Then we're introduced to David Walliams' brother. Wow, you remember? Remember? Wow. Then there's more wow wow moaning from Clara, where the Doctor then promises to save her again. Yawn. There's this cringy death scene that I just don't care about. There's this sequence where this character gets surrounded by the ghosts. Looks like it came straight from the hub. Just saying. One thing I will give this episode, this is one hell of an alien design. Wow, love it. Just a shame that it's got that cliche evil British accent. <sighs> Another plus for this episode is the sequence with the deaf girl not hearing the ghosts behind her. Very suspenseful. Big thumbs up. Her sensing the vibrations is absolutely fantastic. Although I'm not entirely sure why there's a cat sound effect here. <laughs> Why? Cool Monster has a hilarious death scene. But all in all, it comes down to yet another convenient ending where the Doctor knew what was happening all along. Oh, this is getting really boring, guys. I do not like this story at all. It's boring, it's cliche, it's cringe. It's going in not for me. Goodbye, get out. The Girl Who Died. The intro to this episode is so pointless. Seriously, why was this here? Ugh, my least favourite kind of episodes. Vikings or anything set in a forest. Ugh. This episode looks so cheap, it's embarrassing. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. Oh my God. I remember watching this when this aired. This episode made me facepalm so hard. And I remember saying out loud, what the fuck has happened to Doctor Who? Because this... This is woeful. Also, in the Peter Capaldi era, what is it with the GoPro shots? Why do they keep adding these? They've never ever looked good on television. And what a surprise. It's another episode where the Doctor all goes, Where's Clara Oswald? I need to save Clara Oswald. I love Clara so much. I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna get you back. Don't worry, lad. It has happened in every single episode so far. I'm getting absolutely sick to death of it. There's another sequence where Clara gets really cocky because she's so intelligent and it's getting really, really grating at this point. Then they arrange a war like it's a scrap in a Macca's car park? Oh, please, shut up. Shall we say this time tomorrow? Allow it, man. Still, meet me at Macca's down Golden Way, yeah? Tomorrow at 10 o'clock, yeah? Man's gonna murk you, bruv. <laughs>
<laughs> then there's yet another morality chinwag domestic between the Doc and Clara. Wow, everything in this episode has been done ten fucking million times. I'm so bored of it. And I haven't even mentioned Maisie Williams yet, because she is tripe in this. Why is Maisie Williams such a big deal? Oh, because of that one show she did. I've actually completely forgot it. What? what? Game of Thrones, that's it. <laughs> fucking hell. Oh, she was in Game of Thrones or something. Anyway, the war that Maisie declared starts... Well, it doesn't really start. They electrocute the robots with electric eels. How, how have they got electric eels? I'm pretty sure they don't exist in Viking Europe. And then they just bully Odin. They're just like, I'm gonna record you. I'm gonna put it on Facebook and Twitter because I'm trendy with the kids. And then Maisie Williams dies. Why does the Doctor and Clara care so much? Oh, that's right. It's because it's Maisie Williams and she's been paid an extortionate amount of money to be on this show that's now fallen in the mud. The Doctor then has a revelation as to why he chose this face. Whilst it is a neat little tie-in with his arc, the Doctor shouldn't need reminding to save people. It's literally his name. <laughs> then there's this BS MacGuffin that makes Maisie Williams immortal. Then it ends with this hilariously bad shot of Maisie Williams looking out into the distance while time passes by. God, this is shocking. Guys, there is nothing good about this episode. I cannot tell you one thing I like because there isn't one thing I like. This is bad. This is really, really bad. This is going in god awful. All right? I'm ashamed that this is an episode of Doctor Who. This is, this is terrible. The woman who lived... Oh, cool. Another episode set in a forest. Wow, definitely not because of budget or anything. Maisie Williams now has the ability to sound like a posh bloke. Dabbling low pads, the pair of them, with terrible pseudonyms to boot. Then says this. Yes, it is me. Oh, <laughs> so cringe. Oh, uh, I actually think I want River Song back. Then there's like all these comedic flashback sequences with all these royalty-free whoosh sound effects. God, it's awful. Now this. There is so much talking. Talking, 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 talking. Not interesting dialogue. They're just sitting there talking and whinging. Then <laughs> this Catman thing shows up. What is honestly going on? I couldn't tell you. Then there's this hanging sequence. And honestly, guys, there is so much wrong with this. Terrible action, slow motion shots, terrible acting this terrible death scene for the cat man god it looks terrible i was dying for this episode to end and then there's this line i've not forgotten that kiss uh, rufus lad Maisie Williams is like 16 here, you non- All of this anyway for the Doctor to decide he's not going to take Maisie Williams with him, maybe because she's too expensive for the BBC to employ. This episode, guys, guess where it's going? Yeah, that's right. It's going in god awful. Second episode on the trot with nothing I liked about it at all. Get in the bin. The Zygon invasion starts with a flashback to David Tennant and Matt Smith. God, I miss them so much. Been dispersed around the world and are now living amongst us. A among us? Among us? The episode starts out with the Doctor hanging out in a park on his own for some reason. Then he won't leave these two little girls alone. Doctor, what's going on here? You non- Oh, it's all right, because they get kidnapped anyways. Basically, there's a Zygon evolution happening and Clara is definitely not acting suspicious. Unit then orders some children to be game-ended. It's not us who are the imposters. <laughs> among us, among us, among us. That is not your mother. It's an alien hostile. Wow, this unit woman really wants everyone dead, doesn't she? Shock horror. Clara is a Zygon. Wow, this was not obvious at all. Maybe it is because I've seen it already. I don't know. I can't remember if it was subtle or not. It didn't seem very subtle. Anyway, then she aims a bazooka at the doctor's plane. At this point, mate, you're better off not getting on any planes. Seems like a really dangerous way of transport. There's not really much else to say about this episode. I think it's just okay. It's nowhere near as gripping as it thinks it is. <laughs> it's entertaining and it's definitely better than the last two episodes. So I think I'm just going to pop this one in okay the zygon inversion oh cool yet another clara is in an imaginary world because she's dead slash dying this is brand new and never been done before clara argues with clara and then she goes and finds the osgood box this however is what makes this scene peter capaldi his american game show accent bonnie sweetheart one of those buttons 
will unmask every Zygon in the world. His emotion throughout his delivery. How much blood will spill until everybody does what they were always going to have to do from the very beginning? Sit down and talk! I love it. And with one hell of a speech from the Doctor, they of course close the box and the day is saved. Now, whilst Peter Capaldi was absolutely mesmerising in this sequence, that doesn't unfortunately save this boring story. Look, I don't know if Series 9 had a lower budget because it looks so much cheaper than Series 8. And the series has been so boring. I am not enjoying this series at all so far, guys. In case you couldn't tell, I've been sounding like I've wanted to die for the last 10 minutes. This episode, guys, is, of course, going in okay. Sleep no more. Cool, Mark Gattis is back. Oh, hi, Mark. Yet again. Oh, great. This man has not been involved in a good episode of Doctor Who in every single one he has wrote or acted in, and yet he just keeps coming back. Episode starts with cheap introduction to side characters who will most likely die, and we will never, ever care about. The ship is on its way to Satellite 5 to rescue science team. Ugh. Hang on a minute. This base looks exactly like the one from Under the Lake. See what I mean? This series looks cheap. It takes 10 minutes after wandering around in the dark and talking until something actually happens. You know what, guys? I'm sorry. I've, I've, I've really tried. Three times watching this episode, I've fallen asleep. I actually cannot get through it. It's mainly because most of the episodes this series have been so boring, and I've just hit rock bottom at this point. The irony that this episode is called Sleep No More, and all it's actually made me do is sleep. This episode is going in god-awful. Yeah, you're welcome. Face the raven. The episode starts with some, ha ha, look at us. We're having so much epic fun. This is the most fun we've ever had. God, I love you, duck. God, I love you, Clara. We're bestest friends in the whole wide world. And oh, oh, Grimsby's back. Yay. Grimsby has a death tattoo and then just ditches his baby. Cool. That's good, isn't it? He then finds out he's going to be gay mended. <gasps> I'll tell you what, though. This sequence here where the TARDIS is flying over London. God, I miss shots like this. This is what makes Doctor Who, right? We've not had this in ages. A nice little practical shot. It looks so good. Why is there not more of this? They have to find this hidden trap street. And of course, it's Clara who finds it because she's just so smart and clever. Oh, look who's, look who's back. Oh, Maisie Williams again. Great. That's fun. She was good last time. I'm glad she's back. At least there's actually an interesting setting for once, even if it does look like the setting from the London Dungeons. We see the impact of the Raven as this man gets game-ended. And you know what I love about this episode? All of this Clara thinking she's top dog and too intelligent and acting like the Doctor all the time is her downfall. What a fitting ending this is going to be. She convinces Grimsby to transfer the tattoo over to her. Once the tattoo's been passed on, you can't do it again, lamau lamau. Clara walks out to these terrible slow motion shots and faces the raven one of the longest standing companions of new who has finally perished even though it is edited very strangely it is kind of sad however the emotional weight isn't there mainly because clara has been so insufferable the last two series it's, it's ridiculous however peter capaldi's delivery here you'll find that it's a very small universe when i'm angry with you Yo, oh, it's terrifying. I love it. An intriguing premise and concept. Nice simple setting. Great performances from both Peter and Jenna. And finally, the end of Clara. R right? That's, that's the end, right? That's, that's the end, please. Even though this episode is bordering on okay, I'm going to put this episode in good. It's a massive step up from what we've had this series, so I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it for what it is. It's all right. It's, it's good compared to everything else. Heaven sent. The episode starts with the Doctor coughing and spluttering inside of a test tube. Then he has a conversation with some dust. Ugh. The Doctor's being chased by smelly fly lady. Yuck. Then the Doctor game ends himself. <laughs> Anyone watching this for the first time must be so confused. <laughs> I will give this episode this. It is genuinely creepy with some booky jump scares, cuz. It's then revealed that the stinky fly lady will only stop when the Doctor confesses something. In all seriousness, though, this is an episode focusing on grief. An hour of the Doctor simply chatting away. Listen, right? I know I talk a lot about how, oh, there's lots of talking, 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 and I hate it. And then I go on to say, I love episodes where people are just talking. Listen, it's two very different things. There's engaging dialogue where you learn about the character themselves, and then there's just dialogue for the sake of just talking. This series has been a lot of just talking for the sake of talking whereas this episode we are seeing the 12th doctor's character we are seeing him process grief we are seeing how his brain works and it is beautiful the doctor finds out that his escape is in room 12 and then the doctor has to go all minecraft style and mine some diamonds to get back to his tardis we then get the best piece of music ever produced by murray gold <laughs> Oh, 
Honestly, guys, this is the first time I've watched this episode in about five years. Peter Capaldi is simply beautiful in this episode. Barry Gold just flexes his big, sexy musical muscles, and I just cannot fault this episode at all. Shot beautifully, directed beautifully, written beautifully. Yes, yes, yes. It's been a long time coming. This episode is going in perfect well done well done standing ovation for mr stephen moffat well done son now on to the series finale hell bent uh wait, um wait 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 a minute what what's clara doing there what what what's she doing there oh no the time lords want to invite the doctor over for some lovely tea but the doctor's like Psh, bond that i'm eating my soup anyway after a bit of a standoff they end up telling Rassilon to just do one and then he just accepts it he just disappears for the rest of the episode cool for the love of fuck clara's been saved oh great so she's sticking around go woohoo the sequence in the matrix when clara finds out it's been four and a half billion years why would you even Damn, it's been a long time since I've got emotional at Doctor Who. It's so weird. The Doctor and Clara continue to squabble like old times. Then the Doctor has his memory wiped. Wow, didn't see that coming. Whilst I hate the fact that Clara just gets to live on and couldn't die. Cheers, Steve. This episode is actually underrated. I know, shoot me, shoot me. You hellbent haters are going to hate me. I I'm sorry, I enjoy the episode. I like the slight twist that the Doctor has his memory wiped. I like the music. I love the way this episode is shot. I like the direction. I like the editing and shoot me I quite like the story despite the ending all right I'm saying it guys guess what this episode is going in good okay we'll leave it at that ladies and gentlemen it's Christmas 2015 which means it's time for the husband of River Song. woo husbands I suppose this episode was coming really finally a wrap up for the River Song story we are introduced a brand new character and new companion Andy from Little Britain hang on a minute aren't they just using the same set from face the Raven god damn this cheap show man Oh my god, River Song is back and she's married to the Taskmaster. Whoa. Let me get one thing straight. I fundamentally hate this comedic intro. It's River's last episode and she seems so out of character. This is after everything she's gone through as well. It just... It, uh, no. It, no, no, no. This episode is so cartoony at times. It's really uncomfortable. This, you know who I am, goes on for way too long. And how does River not recognise him? It's so stupid. Although I did burst out laughing when the doctor said this. Before you come in, you better prepare yourself for a shock. Finally. Doctor and River end up in fancy restaurant to sell the Taskmaster's head. But then it turns out they all love the Taskmaster. So, uh-oh, they're in a predicament. Although it's way too comedic for my liking, Peter Capaldi's one-liners are great in this. I do not like surprises. Oh, it's going to be a funny old day. Anyway, River Song's all like, God, I love the Doctor and he's so useless he will never even show up because that was technically impossible because he's never done that before. And then she recognises him. Wow, how cute and lovely. And then the ship goes bam. The only thing really good about this episode is that it ties up the plot hole of how River got her sonic screwdriver. And it is a very nice ending. Wow, River Song is leaving the show forever and ever. Please don't bring her back. Thank you. It's got lots of Christmas fun. It's got some comedy that's good, but it's, it's just way too much for me. Like, it's just a bit overbearing. It's pushing on the border of good, but I'm going to put this episode in okay. Uh, look at this series, guys. Way too mediocre. One episode that was perfect. Quite a few episodes I really didn't like, and you can see why I found this series so bad. Boring. But ladies and gentlemen, it has been confirmed that Stephen Moffat will be departing Doctor Who along with Peter Capaldi after series 10. There's a new companion, we're having a reset for some reason, and the show will be wrapping up the Stephen Moffat era. Let's head on down to series 10, baby! 2016 saw one episode of Doctor Who, so I'm expecting high budget and big bombastic episode. The Doctor gives a little boy a happy pill and then he starts levitating. Alex Hunter is giving a speech and Andy interrupts him. Oh, okay. I guess Matt Lucas is sticking around. Woohoo. Then Alex Hunter gets game ended. Not Superman saves not Lois. Oh, no. I get it. It's 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 supposed to be cringy because it's what they do in the superhero films, but it was still painful. Then there is this very, very cool comic book style split screen conversation. Very nicely edited. The way it overlaps 
beautiful. I'm loving this. The sexual innuendo scene, though, was a little bit uncomfortable. Uh-oh, there's a big nuke heading right towards New York. But it's okay because Noel Clark Kent saves the day. Wow. This episode is pure Russell T. Davis vibes. I really, really enjoy it. But I think it's mainly because this episode is so damn cheesy. And God, Stephen Moffat's era has been lacking cheese. It's just been a bit more cringe than cheese, if I'm being honest. And you know what? I can't really fault this episode for trying something different. Sure, there's a few annoying, cringy moments but I think this episode is really enjoyable nonetheless and very different. I enjoyed it guys, all right? I'm putting this episode in good. Series 10 now, ladies and gentlemen. Stephen Moffat decided on his last series to go for a complete reset for people to jump on. This makes no sense because the whole format of the show is literally about to change. The pilot starts with some hefty nostalgia bait just to help the new viewers somehow. And of course, because there's a new companion, we get that cliche, Doctor Who? What are you, what are you a doctor of then, mate? Are you a doctor? A doctor of who? I like that they put the 12th Doctor's monologues to actual use this series by making him an actual professor very nice the cinematography in this episode is absolutely beautiful along with the direction love it anyway bill gets shown a puddle and then love interest gets all weird about it there's some waters of mars shit going on but i will say the introduction to the tardis in this episode is great doctor it's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside hey we got there I like that. Very good. I like it. I like how they use the alien's ability to follow them to show the abilities of the TARDIS to the new viewers. Very nice. They go to a different place. They go into the future. It's very cool. Anyway, they meet the Daleks because obviously you have to introduce the Daleks to the new audience. They have some very Chris Chibnall level aiming. Yeah, not a fan. Anyway, Heather shows Bill some stars or something and then she just dips. Wow, what an episode this is. Right, I'll, I'll say this. This episode does a really good job as a pilot by establishing the Doctor, how the TARDIS works, the enemies and the new companion very good very good well done Stephen moffat i also really like the ending when the doctor is about to wipe bill's memory and she says w what if someone did it to you and then the subtle clara's theme that plays in the background absolutely beautiful that is the impact of murray gold's music on this show that piece of music alone lets us piece it together ourselves without telling us directly i love that this episode is very good all right it's just the cgi water looks absolutely awful all right cgi water has it's always really obvious and the story itself is nothing groundbreaking but as a series opener it is very good guys so i'm going to put this episode in good the intro to smile is great the visible excitement of the doctor that he gets to flex on bill about the tardis is lovely we are then shown some robots who game end you if you do not smile i love the visual design of this planet but all turns dark when they find that they've been growing cucumbers with people's skulls Ugh. then the doctor makes another we don't check my browser history please because i watch a lot of adult movies i spend a lot of years on my own please don't check it all right i know this episode wasn't written by steven but it's getting a little bit old now all right and i know there's another one coming as well the doctor then wants to blow the place up and then he finds out that there's actually lots of people on there they're all just having a little snooze anyway to fix this big issue the doctor simply turns the robots on and off again and the day is saved Ugh. Look, I love the setting. The tension was very good at times. Bill is really growing on me, but the resolution, yuck, is a bit naff. If you're watching this for the first time, it's all right, but I probably won't watch this episode again. Um, I'm going to put this episode in okay. Thin Ice. Big CGI monster is under the Thames. Ugh, this episode is not going to be good, is it? Somebody keeps shining laser pens on the thin ice. Goddamn rascals. Anyway, the doctor gets mugged by some children, and then Bill asks if he's killed anyone. And to be fair, the sass he gives, I like it. Do you want to help me? Do you want to stand here, stamp on your foot? Because let me tell you something, I'm 2,000 years old. Anyway, Doc and Bill go for some some underwater exploring or something. I don't care. I like this sequence where the doctor tells Bill that she has a temper, only for him to then uh, lose his temper. Very good. Thumbs up. Haha. <laughs> <laughs> Tory man gets punched in the face. Uh, and then the doctor then gets a man killed. So that's good, isn't it? Anyway, they set the monster free. Yada yada. Guys, this episode is a snooze fest. Like, it's not quite god awful as there is some interesting conflict between the Doctor and Bill. I don't want to watch this episode again. I don't want to go near this episode again. It's going in, not for me. Wow, 
out, Bill moves into haunted house with new friends that we've never heard of. And the doctor's all like, ah, there's be some stranger things going on, lad. Then the house starts getting all spooky and there's some hilarious death scenes. And then this wooden lady just pops her head in. You know, hello, love. Yeah, they try and be really emotional with this episode. Wow, what a twist. The creepy landlord is actually her son or something. You're really supposed to care because we're playing sad music, guys. Oh, look, there's, there's fireworks going on now. <laughs> what the fuck's going on? <laughs> wooden lady just takes her son slash father slash brother whatever and everyone is brought back to life christ this episode sucks <laughs> i was gonna put it in not for me but you know what nah this episode's god awful get out get out go away oxygen yes pretty morbid opening shot with two dead people just floating through space love it and an episode with a uh, little space zombies mm. although i will say the look of these dead people in this are horrific oh it's so morbid i love it anyway screwdriver destroyed tardis lost okay this could be very good. The tension in this episode is sky high. Bill's helmet gets taken off and she is exposed to the vacuum of space. But of course she survived. There's still seven episodes left, guys. Come on. Something has happened to the Doctor. <gasps> he is now blind. <gasps> still seven episodes left. And now I'm blind. Can you imagine how unbearable I'm going to be when I pull this off? I love that line. That's a great line. But wait, Bill then gets zombified. God, this story is twisted and turning all over the shop. I love it. We have some wonderful political commentary about humans being disposable and being replaced by cheaper alternatives by the higher ups. Yes, this is great. Anti-capitalisms. And the ending to this episode was actually quite good. I liked it. The stakes were high. The doctor is blind. I was on the edge of my seat the whole damn time. God, that started sounding like a bit of a rap going on there. I like this episode. It's going in good. Extremis, the start of the Monkey Donkey trilogy. Anyway, it simply just explained to us that Missy was in the vault the whole time. Six episodes worth of build up just revealed in some dialogue. Okay. Anyway, this is top seller on Amazon that everyone's asking the Doctor to read called The Veritas or something. Apparently it makes you want to kill yourself. I will say the sequence where Bill brings a date home and the Pope shows up is absolutely fantastic. Great comedy that. However, one thing I do not like about this episode is these jarring cuts between the main story and then the Doctor and Missy stuff. I just feel like this could have just been at the end. Doesn't really make sense to be here. Are you secretly a badass? Nothing secret about it, baby doll. I'm gonna say it, right? Some of you lot suck Nardole off way too much. So overrated, this guy. I just find him cringy more than I find him funny. It's just annoying me. But hey ho, the doctor gets his eyes back and then starts getting growled at by someone's dead nan. Bill, Andy, and science men just shout numbers at each other before they blow themselves up. That's fun. And it's then revealed that they are in the Matrix all along. Ooh. God, there's a lot to unpack in this episode with a lot of WTFs. Consider me intrigued for the next part. Very intriguing setup. Missy is back. Lots of confusion. I will say this episode is going in good. Whoa, a pyramid has appeared at the end of the world <laughs> We then get more of that president of the world BS. Yuck. Look, it's pretty simple. The dead nans just want to conquer the world. Is that too much to ask? The doctor then just presses his sonic glasses and just uploads top secret documents to the web. I hate this kind of stuff. Some things are just too implausible. My parents are aliens gets inviscerated because of the outbreak of the Rona. The same then happens again when Andy just taps buttons and hacks into cameras. Ugh, yawn. Just removes any tension or any stakes. The resolution is way too convenient as well, but I will say the editor's episode brings it back with the Doctor being blind finally has an impact. There's a problem. Love it. The pacing is way too slow, just like most of the Peter Capaldi era. And despite the great cliffhanger, this episode is just going in okay. It's starting to deteriorate now, isn't it? I can't say that word. The lie of the land. The Doctor is now David Attenborough slash YouTuber man. The world is now North Korea or something. Anyway, Nardo pulls out convenient MacGuffin to just find the doctor how convenient because it would be too much to do some actual thinking and figuring out hmm anyway more convenience occurs when a random bloke just takes them on board the boat who's the guy oh it's all right bill just explains it via voiceover okay cool and then more convenience happens when the monks interrupt an id check that would have got bill and nardal killed this is so convenient right now anyway the doctor then shouts at bill for saving him and she gives an incredible performance this is the best performance from pearl Mackey yet well done love Anyway, Bill's like, bun that, and then she starts game-ending the Doctor. But wait, <laughs> it was the biggest <laughs> prank of all time. Wow, Doctor, what a prankster. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Doctor, what was that? <laughs> 
Well, at least Missy's back, I guess. Way. Well, turns out Missy, through more convenience, just happened to have fought these monks before and says Bill needs to be game ended to break the psychic link. Yada yada. Sarovia neck pinch. I've studied their martial arts for a while, actually. Yeah, can't do it with this hand, though. Ugh, Matt Lucas is really starting to grate on me now. His acting in this is so poor, and the comedy is just not funny. Bill then decides to sacrifice herself, but in typical Stephen Moffat era style, the power of love and emotion saves the day. Day. I mean, look at this tripe. Christ. What a letdown. So much convenience. Lackluster story. Terrible attempts of comedy. This episode, guys, is going in not for me. Yuck. The only thing stopping me putting this in god awful is this line at the end. Why'd you put up with us then? In among seven billion, it's someone like you. Aww. That's very sweet, Doctor. Empress of Mars. Oh, Mark, please, will you just piss off for a minute, mate? <laughs> the TARDIS just decides to act up for no reason at whatsoever. Wow, another episode with the Ice Warriors where the TARDIS disappears, written by Mark Gattis. Wow, this is brand new and never done before. The one thing I do like in this episode is the continuity to Queen Victoria. Wow, that is the bare minimum, guys. Friday. Has been using these Brexit boys to find his side piece. God, the Ice Warriors look so bad. They do not suit modern Who. They didn't even suit classic Who. Honestly, I cannot take them seriously. And then they start turning people into like these bouncy cuboids. What the fuck's going on? There's boring talking and the day is just saved or something. God, what a tripe episode. Honestly, TARDIS plays up for no reason. Terrible looking Ice Warriors. Terrible comedy. Terrible story. Get out of my sight. God awful, please. The Eaters of Light. This episode, ladies and gentlemen, is the one that I've watched the least. I don't even think I've ever actually finished this episode. And I remember why. Because it starts off with some terrible child acting. Oh, and it's another episode set in a damn forest. The second I see trees, the episode is tripe. That's fact. I'm guessing it's set in a forest because of... Budget. And look at that, it gets even worse when there's a terrible CGI monster in the woods. Ugh. And there's also some janky Russell T. Davis era POV shots, man. Like, come on. And the unalive bodies look hilarious. Boring, 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 boring talking and the day is saved or something. I don't know. No, guys, this is a tripe episode. Like, it's hilarious. No, it's not even hilariously bad. It's just mind-numbingly bad. Episodes like this make me remember why Doctor Who doesn't need a 10 plus episode series, right? It just needs seven or eight this is worse than god awful this episode snooze fest terrible setting it looks unbearably cheap terrible acting this is bottom of the barrel filler absolutely woeful get out god awful obviously they were just making way for the finales world enough in time the doctor is about to regenerate the end is coming missy pretends to be Doctor Who. She refers to Bill and Nardo as exposition and comic relief. Oh, wow, this show is so self-aware. Well done, guys. And uh, I will say, Missy Davling is an absolute war crime. Put her away. What? what? Shock horror, shock horror. Bill's been shot. Bill has been shot by Smurf Man. Damn, the first time I ever saw this episode, that shot me to my core and it still shot me then. Wow. Bill gets taken away and wakes up to definitely not the master in disguise. I will say this sequence with the patients tapping pain is absolutely horrific. It's shot beautifully. As well. Pain, pain, pain. Doctor explains time dilation. One side of the ship is going much faster than the other. A blink of an eye, it's a second for them, but six years or something for Bill? Wow, what a fascinating concept. And definitely not the Master and Bill, they become good old chums. But uh oh, he's pranked her big time because he's taken her to be converted into a scary Cyberman. Doctor eventually goes to find her and leaves Missy on her own. When has that ever been good, Mr. Doctor? <gasps> What? Oh my god. Not Master? Was the Master all along? Definitely wasn't ruined by the fact they showed the twist in the last episode's next time trailer. Why did they do this? Showing the Master in the promotional footage for this series, I get why they did it. Doctor Who was falling off a cliff at this point. But my god, it ruins this twist. Can you imagine if you didn't have a clue this was going to happen? This twist would have been the best Stephen Moffat twist of all time. But no, they had to ruin it to get their precious 300,000 viewers. But my god, guys. What a cliffhanger this episode has. Such a great build-up. And there's some seriously spooky moments. Rachel Talala Lala Lele is a great director. The music is great. The performances are fantastic. God damn, this episode is great. And that's exactly where I'm putting it, baby. 
which leads us on to the series 10 finale the doctor falls we get this like year seven drama sequence where missy and the master are circling the doctor and then this the doctor changing the code is so hilariously stupid what, what is that that's embarrassing the doctor's dead he told me he'd always hated you let's go uh, this did make me laugh. I like this bit. There's this really emotional scene where Bill finds out what she is. A scary, spooky Cyberman. And my God, Pearl Mackey's performance is absolutely sublime here. Well done. But then we get all this standing around and talking for another 20 minutes. That's fantastic, isn't it? Because the Cybermen begin their attack. <gasps> and while this is going on, the Master's busy fondling himself. That's good. It's a bit uncomfortable, really. Meanwhile, Andy's dropping some mad riz on the mum from Sex Education. And I'm not going to go into this too much because everybody knows the iconic speech that the Doctor gives to Missy and the master everyone knows it it's brilliant well done mr peter capaldi i like your performance here anyway he gives the speech and then missing the master like i'm speaking fluent japanese though bond that man <laughs> And they just ignore him. But it's alright because they game end each other. Oh no. It's so sad to see Missy go like this. She's definitely my master. That's for sure. And I hope that's the end of the master for good. <laughs> right? No, no, master, no more master, please. No more master. The Doctor then gets blasted by a Cyberman. And then we get that beautiful music from Murray Gold. As the 12th Doctor then decides to just blow up all the Cybermen. And he somehow doesn't get inviscerated. The shot of him looking up at the sky with the flames. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. What's this? Why, why is the puddle, why is the puddle appear? Oh no, Stephen, please. Stephen, what are you doing, Stephen? He's given her the same ending as Clara. He's given her the same ending as Clara Oswald. Stephen, no! Stephen, you absolute pussy. But you know what? The ending is somewhat saved by <gasps> appearance by Bradley Walsh. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry, uh, David Bradley. I get confused. I'm one series too early. There is some remarkable performances in this episode. And the highlight was Pearl Mackey and Michelle Gomez, right? As always. But this second part was so flat. Destroying the ridiculously advanced Cybermen with a single apple and Nardole's bloody Chromebook. God. And the ending was a complete cop-out. Look, I can only let some of this slide, right? Because this was supposed to be Stephen Moffat's last episode, right? But no, Chris Chibnall doesn't want to do a Christmas episode. So Stephen Moffat had to go back to the drawing board and create a whole new episode to, just to get that Christmas special in. And what was it all for? Well, it was for nothing because Chris still took him away. <sighs> this episode, guys, is going in okay. It could have been so much more. So much more! But it was so disappointing. <sighs> Let's hope Peter Capaldi's last episode goes out with an absolute bang. Twice upon a time. What a delicious opening transition that was. Wow. We get the Doctor meet the Doctor, both refusing to regenerate. Oh, this could be good. This could be real. Mark Gattis. Why? Why is Mark Gattis in this episode? Could they not find any other actor in the wide range of actors out there? They pull back Mark Gattis again. The World War One line, though, is pretty iconic. What do you mean? One. And you guys know I'm going to take issue with the Stephen Moffat making the first Doctor a raging sexist for the sake of some comedy. Why have you done this, Stephen? Are you happy? Did you think everyone was going to, Lamau, Lamau, Doctor's a raging sexist. Ha <laughs> ha, he hates women. Is he here? Is the Doctor here? <sighs> uh, and uh, what, why, why is Bill back? Why is Bill back? <laughs> For God's sake, Stephen, please. She had her ending. We then meet the testimony. This god-awful CGI as well. It just looks so cheap. Then we get more of this. Hey, look at every Doctor that's ever been because the Doctor's so brilliant. This is Stephen's, like, favourite thing to do, by the way. He's done it so many times. We get it. This is not the only Doctor. We get who he is. And then we get some more sexism just sprinkled on top before we get that final browser history joke. There we go. We got it. You're a stupid, bloody ass. Yep, guys, this is the uh, level of dialogue we are getting in Peter's last episode. Why? Because it's all for some cheap laughs. Wow. Brilliant. Well done. One thing I do like, because, of course, this is Murray Gold's final episode as the composer for Doctor Who, so they're playing all of his bangers subtly in the background. We have Doomsday, Shepherd's Boy, we've got the Doctor's theme. They can walk among us again. <gasps> among us! Among us! Imposters! Imposters! 
<laughs> anyway, it turns out there is no evil scheme, right? And then they just put Mark Gattis back to die. David Bradley says his goodbyes, and we get that beautiful Ood song music from the end of time. Just to wrap it up, we get that transition back to William Hartnell. God, that is some juicy little bit of filmmaking right there. Love that. Clara then shows up. Why? It is brought back somewhat when the Doctor says goodbye to Bill and Andy. That's a very nice little scene. Peter Capaldi, the 12th Doctor, then enters his TARDIS for the last time. His speech is rendered pretty much pointless when you watch this in hindsight. He's there giving all this advice to the next Doctor. Be kind, be brilliant, be this, be that. And, and when you look back, you realise, yeah, we got none of that with Jodie's Doctor. None of that at all. I let you go. Just like that, the Doctor regenerates. God, it looks awful. Why does this look so bad? It looks so nasty. This looks cheaper than when Christopher Eccleston regenerated. The effects look terrible. Oh, you couldn't even get that right in Peter's last episode. Such a shame. And with that, Peter was gone. We are then shown Jodie Whittaker, the 13th Doctor. Guys, it's just hit me <laughs> that the time has come for me to sit down and watch the entirety of the Chibnall era, <laughs> and I am not happy. Just to clarify, this final episode is going in... <sighs> Okay, I want to be, I want to, I want to give it good, but it's, it's not, I'm afraid. It's going in okay. So there you guys have it. The Stephen Moffat era has come to a close. We say goodbye to Stephen Moffat himself, Murray Gold, the crew that made this wonderful show, albeit in its state of decline. This was the last time Doctor Who felt like Doctor Who. And I have ripped on Stephen Moffat a lot in his era, and rightly so. The man can be arrogant and can get wrapped up in his own head. It doesn't go without saying though that he is an incredible writer and did a lot for this show and we have to give him the respect he deserves and he's made some absolute cracking series of Doctor Who so well done Stephen take a bow my son I look at this era and I think god there's so many highs but my god there are so many lows all we need now is Chris Chibnall to freshen up the show a little bit with some amazing stories and exciting times <laughs> I'm sure we're going to get that. Here's a final look at my tier lists. Guys, let me know your opinions in the comments below. I'm sure some of you are going to be furious with me. And that's fine. As long as you're respectful and not just nasty for no reason. I suppose I should start working on the Chris Chibnall video now. <laughs> oh my god. Guys, I massively appreciate you for sitting through and watching this video. The support for the first part was incredible. And I hope this second part lived up to the billing. Uh, and guys, I will leave it at that. Thank you very much for joining me. And I will see you guys in part three. And I know some of you guys are going to be very excited for that one. <laughs> oh God. I'll see you guys in a bit. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>